Oh, yeah! I am awake and alive and alive and alive. I'm so great, I gotta say it twice and cut it out once. My head's a syrup bottle that's getting tipped over every Wednesday. You're a storyteller in a storytelling podcast, and the only story you're telling now is a story about stories you don't want to tell! What the fuck?! Hey, what's happening, Mike Schmidt, 40 year old boy podcast? You know what, folks? I've been, po- and she was pointing for, like, was it a minute? It seemed like a minute. She was pointing and recording and recording and pointing. I, th- I say you leave that silence in. Because we'll have the theme song, and they'll just have like this long ass silence. Everybody's like, "Ah, oh, fucking Lily, she didn't put the show up." Because you know that's the, that's the first thing they think of is fucking Lily. Uh, nobody's mad at me because everybody knows I'm here and locked and loaded and ready to talk. Hey, have mouth, we'll talk, folks. That's how it works with Mike Schmidt in Mike Schmidt Land. Uh, oh my God! By the way, the worst amusement park you'll ever visit in your life. Oh my Christ, Mike Schmidt Land is terrible. It is just, uh, it is just, uh, although I will tell you that what you want to do, the first thing you do, go right, you know the ball pit that you jump in at Chuck E. Cheese? I've got one filled with the candy from Trader Joe's. Oh, you just got to eat your way out of there. God damn it, that's actually not bad. I would get one of those ball pits and fill it with like candy from Trader Joe's. It would be, fu- well, no, you got to have clean, you take a shower before you jump in. Uh, I, by the way, Lily, she was trying to indicate like that it would be, uh, there would be body odor and stuff. And she pointed at areas of her body that I would not normally imagine there to be any sort of filth. Uh, no, yes, that's exactly what you did. Cause she made a face like, ew. And then she pointed here and here and, uh, oh, getting caught under those places. Well, it's good. Yeah. It's going to cut under your, your tits. Of course. Yeah. Uh, You might have actually, you might have candy under there now. (laughs) <laughs> How do you not? Oh my god, if you had giant tits like that, if I had big tits like that, I would have candy under them at all times. So when people came on they're like nice tits, I would literally lift them up and then candy would pour out like a piñata. Oh man, that's perfect. It's like a special bonus. Not only are my tits great, but look at this, they reward your children as well. God damn it. They provide sweets. Not only is my rack amazing, but it has sweets for you as well. God damn it. Why uh, why don't I run tits? I should run tits. If I was in charge of tits, that's what would happen. They would all they would dispense candy from the bottom. Like a like a like a, uh, a like a Pez dispenser with a tit on the top. God damn it, that's fantastic. All right, folks. So, I should be the boss of tits. If if somehow look, when's the next election? That's the thing. I want to know when they're hiring. Is tits hiring? We got to call tits Inc. Is it tits Inc.? It might be. It might be tits Industries. I have no idea what it is. Whatever. The the bottom line is I got to get an application in there, folks. And uh, by the way, copyrighted. We got to. You know what? We got to take this show and mail it to me so they don't steal this goddamn idea. That's right. Back off, tits. You know, you can't take the candy falling out of the bottom of tits idea and not compensate me. And I'm not taking any candy out of your tits either, motherfucker. I want cold green cash. I can't. This is a money idea. This isn't a candy idea. Look, I got plenty of ideas that are candy ideas. This is a money idea. And holy fuck, do I need it at this point in time? I need money. Folks, I am uh, I am ready to just perish. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. I'm just going to tell you that right now, I, without revealing too much. Because, you know, it's funny. This show is drawn from my life. And I tell you things that are from my life. But uh, I, I can't tell you some of the shit that's going on now. I can't. I want to. I really would love to. I don't know why I want to. I, I, what's that going to do? It's not going to do anything but depress you. Because you sit there right now and you're thinking to yourself, Mike's life is nothing but laughs and money. And I know you feel that way. I know in your heart, you're like, except for the people who write me and, and are mad that I bitch when I don't have any money or when I get mad about stuff. I had a guy, look, all right, look, listen, listen. <laughs> Folks, if you don't like this show or, or, or if I say things that like, I, just stop listening. Just stop. I'm not going to correct them. I'm not going to change. You understand that, right? We're in year five of me acting like a jackass. It's not fucking changing. I'm a jag off who's trying to evolve and hopefully things will change in the, in the interim. But I mean, uh, uh, when it gets right down to it, I'm still this guy. This is who I am. It's not going to fucking change. There's a, there's a person out there who's a nice man. I'm sure he's a wonderful man. He's offered me i uh, uh, I've talked about him before because he wrote shitty things to me. Not shitty. See, this is where it's going to, it gets to the root of this. God damn it. Listen to me. <laughs> he bitched when I bitched about the Vitamix. When I talked about the Vitamix and I was like, oh, he's like, hey, you know, why the fuck do you even need a Vitamix? And then you whine about it all the fucking time. And it's like, God damn it, dude. What? Stop listening. All right. If you don't want to hear about my adventures with the blender, just get the fuck off my feed. That's another thing that makes me laugh. I'm on Twitter and there are people, there's a guy I follow and uh, he's a baseball guy. He's just a baseball guy. But then people will write mean things to him and he goes, get the fuck off my feed. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, how tough are you? Really? It's Twitter, for fuck's sake. You can't act tough on Twitter. Because you know why? It's called Twitter. 
It's impossible for you to bow up and get all small on fucking Twitter, you dumb fuck. Literally, like, if you write a mean thing, I, if, you, if anybody ever writes a mean thing to me on Twitter, I'm just going to write them back, tweet, tweet. <laughs> Look at that little bluebird up in the corner, motherfucker. He's the bluebird of happiness. I refuse to be brought down by you and your anonymous bullshit. So this fucking guy wrote me, and again, I've been nice to him in the past, and he's nice to me, and we've gone back and forth, and he offered me a nice room and a bed and breakfast. He's a wonderful person. Uh, he lives in an area of the country where he runs a bed and breakfast, but then he wrote me to say, we don't even have one of those in my uh, Vitamixes in my bed and breakfast. You're a dick. Like, he was that mad at me. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck you want me to do? If I want to piss my money away in a blender, I'll do it. Uh, and, and, but it was all cordial. But then, then, he fucking writes me, and, he, uh, and it just says... Uh, Hey, did you ever notice when you do something wrong, it's okay, but when other people like make requests of you, they're crazy assholes or whatever? Like, And I wanted to go, yeah, yes, I have noticed that. I want to write him back and go, hey, have you ever noticed that I do a comedy show on the internet and sometimes I amp shit up so it sounds a little crazier than it really is and I'm not really mad at the Joe Walsh guy? You do understand that, right? Tom was cool with it. Tom, who sent me Joe Walsh, wrote me and said, hey, man, that was awesome. Ha <laughs> ha. And I'm like, good, because I wasn't trying to tell you never to listen to me again. And if you have more Joe Walsh related publications around your home, please feel free to send them to me. I would love to read them. I don't know what other crazy hobbies Joe Walsh has, what other uh, you know niche magazines he's posed for. But by all means, get them in the mail to me. I demand it. I want an influx of Eagle related reading material. But this guy wrote me and he's just like, hey, did you ever notice that like when anybody, anybody else does something, they're nuts, but you do it and you're okay? Yes, I have noticed that. Have you noticed that that's kind of the theme of this show? That I'm, by the way, the show's called The 40-Year-Old Boy because I'm an asshole, right? Because I'm an immature child who does whatever the fuck he wants and, does, and, and also holds other people to impossible standards. You understand that, correct? Hey, you ever notice when someone else does something, they're crazy? It's like, I, yes, George Carlin, I did notice that. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I don't know. And, and again, you're a nice man. I love you. I thank you. I don't love you. Really? That seems strong. I don't, I don't know if you and I have bought it to the point now where I actually have brought you into my heart as someone I care for. And yet, as a listener, I do tell you that I'm happy that you're on board. But you're you're more than welcome to stop listening anytime you'd like. And and I and when he writes stuff like that to me, it makes me when anybody writes stuff like that, you're not the, you're not the only one. Bed and breakfast. Other people have written me ridiculous shit. And I and I'm always like, are they trying to solve the mystery of this show? Is that what they're trying to do, <laughs> folks? There's no there's no chewy center to this show. It's all hard candy. <laughs> This entire fucking show is hard candy with no chewy center to discover in the middle. There's no, you don't, there are no licks to get to the center of this show. If Mr. Owl's like, hey, how many licks does it take to get to the center of this show? None. He would go one, a two, who, a three. And then he'd bite it and then he'd break his fucking teeth because it's hard candy, motherfucker. <laughs> Quit trying to get to the bottom of it. My show's not a Scooby Doo mystery. You and your dog and your hippie fucking friend and your idiot in the cravat and your nerdy girlfriend and the hot chick can pull your van over and quit analyzing my fucking show. I do the show that I want and and I'm going to do it and I will do it no matter what you meddling kids seem to think. (laughs) There's no mystery of my show to get to the bottom of. There's no, it's just, it is what it is. It's just me talking. I just, I met, I saw a comic, Brody Stevens, the other day. And, uh, and this, uh, this is, by the way, this will tell you exactly what kind of a touchstone I have with the comedy community now. I'm talking to Brody and uh, I'm like, how's it going? Because he went to Austin and he did a, a festival in Austin. And he's been traveling. He's been doing some shows with Neil Hamburger. I'm like, how's that going, man? He was in Portland. He was in Seattle. And I know you just made a face about Neil Hamburger. All right, Lily made a face. Uh, I don't know if you know who Neil Hamburger is. All right, let me, uh, let me tell you a little story about Neil Hamburger. <laughs> All right. Neil Hamburger is a comedian uh, who purposely bombs. That's his deal. Uh, he, he does a thing where he completely bombs on purpose. And now I, I will tell you how I discovered Neil Hamburger. I may have talked about this on the show before. I don't know if I did or I didn't. I'm sure Bed and Breakfast has a, a, dos- a dossier where he's going to go ahead and go, wait a second, hold on. <laughs> this week. Hold on. He's flipping through a book of pages. Hold on. I believe back at episode 11 in year three, you shut up. <laughs> God damn, make some scones for building four. Uh, is it building? They're not buildings, right? Bed and breakfast is not a whole building. That would seem odd. That's like that's prison, actually. <laughs> if you have a bed and breakfast with actual buildings, that's a prison. 
uh, room for, bedroom for. I don't know what the fuck it is. Yeah, put on, you know what, just fucking go fuck with a French press for nine hours and make shitty coffee. All right. Uh, I don't drink coffee. I don't know if a French press is good or bad. I don't know anything about it. Just know that that's what leaped into my head right there. Uh, and I, uh, he's going to write me some note where he's going to be like, dude, you're awful, right? You're all awful. I'm going to go, yes, I'm awful. That's the point. You've pointed out how awful I am in previous letters. Which I have then, you know what, here's, feel good about this bed and breakfast. Every time you write me a letter that points out, hey, do you ever realize that uh, other people are jerks and you're a jerk too? Yes, I print it out and I put it in my Vitamix and I shred the fucking thing. <laughs> I make a protein shake with your fucking email put right in. It's, actually, it's a little stronger than that. That seemed weird. That sounded like a, it sounded awful, like almost like a weed whacker under a couch. That's, I just did that noise. Uh, if you if you had a, somehow if you were whacking weeds under a couch if you're a redneck right now you're in Georgia and you got a couch out in your yard and you want to get the weeds and you jammed a weed whacker it would go that's what it would sound like uh, that's actually that's very close to my Chewbacca all right so if if somehow you had Chewbacca under a couch listen to me put your weed whacker down for just a second Georgia peek under your couch because Chewbacca may be under there you heard that noise didn't you all right. Uh, <laughs> That's Chewbacca pinned under a couch in Georgia. Uh, why is he in Georgia? Why would he go there? He stay out of the States, Chewbacca. We're not good to Wookiees. We don't like gay people or Wookiees. It's the way it is in this town, especially in the South. Holy shit. If a Wookiee's going to come here, go to New York. You'll blend right in. Don't go to the fucking South. They'll shoot you. They're looking for Bigfoot forever down there. Literally, they're out, like, they have patrols still to this day in Georgia. They have posses that go out into the woods looking for, first of all, escaped slaves because they can't let it go. Why can't you let it go? I got news for you. If a slave fled the plantation in 1811, A, good on him for being uh, able to hide for fucking 200 years. And B, I'm going to assume he hasn't set up camp. If he somehow got away from you, Georgia, and he's, he went into the woods, he has exited the woods at some point. There is not a, an escaped slave colony living in the woods right now trying to stay away from you because slavery may still be in effect. Trust me, they get newspapers delivered in the woods. Oh, I gave it away. They are in the woods. Damn it. <laughs> so if you're a Wookiee, stay out of Georgia. All right. So because that, as they as they go out with their posses and they look for escaped slaves, they will see you and just and they look, they're not going to know what to make of you. First of all, they're all going to think you're Bigfoot. As I've mentioned, they're all going to think you're Bigfoot. And then you're just going to get filled with southern bullets. I don't want that to happen to a Wookiee. So right now, if you're a Wookiee and you're in Georgia, hide under a couch. <laughs> Although, you know what? Bullshit, because I just told Georgia to look under the couches for you. Holy shit. I've ruined it for Wookiees. I'm sorry, I've blown your cover. Hop in the Millennium Falcon and get the fuck out of there. Not that every Wookiee has a Millennium Falcon. We all know there's only one of those. If you're Chewbacca, get in the Millennium Falcon and flee Georgia immediately. If you're another Wookiee, I don't know, get in your ship, hop on a horse. I don't know what the fuck you people do. The only time I've ever seen Chewbacca do anything, he's on the Millennium Falcon. I don't know. Maybe you have a subway. Like, there's a special Wookiee subway. Maybe there's an underground railroad that you could get on, Wookiee. Hold on a second. Perhaps there's an underground railroad that Wookiees could climb on in Georgia. And it's like, a, and to get to the north, we need to get the Wookiees to the north. Can we please? We've done it before. I think I read it in a, in a textbook before. There was an underground railroad of some import way back when. Uh, you know where it didn't run? Through the woods, apparently, because those guys fled into the woods and immediately set up camp. Why? Get the fuck out of there. It's 1811. Go find somewhere to go. Perhaps if there were an underground railroad to get Wookiees out of Georgia. Yeah, I've, I've hit upon something. All right. Uh, if only Harriet Tubman the Eighth were there. Um, that's right, right? Harriet Tubman? She's the underground railroad. Rosa Parks is the bus chick. All right. I've got it all squared away. Listen, I've got it all squared away, folks. It's not even February. Look at the nuggets of knowledge I'm bringing to you, folks. However, it is May, which, as we all know, is uh, is Wookiee History Month. So, uh, all right. So, the fuck was I saying? I didn't remember what I was saying. Oh, I'll get to him in a second. So, uh, I was talking, yeah, I'm talking about Neil Hamburger. Somehow, I wanted to escape slaves living in the woods. Because they are in the woods, I guarantee there are, there's a, there's going to be a colony of somebody in the woods. Because I've been reading now, folks. As I've uh, and I am, I will tell you, as this show started out with me telling you that I can't tell you things about my life. But let's just I, uh, when I tell you these next few things, you'll understand exactly where I'm at these days. Um, I just read a story about people who live underground in Las Vegas. 
they live in storm drains and uh and they, and they're happy to do so like these people that's that's my favorite part whenever they interview these people nobody's pissed off that they live in a storm drain everybody's like well we found a double bed in the dumpster and now we live in a storm drain yay like they're so happy they're like ah i'm so happy i can do heroin away from the prying eyes of the world because inevitably once it, you start unfolding and unpeeling the fucking storm drain dweller onion you're going to get to the center of it heroin heroin is always at the center of the storm drain dweller onion no matter how good they try to make it sound because that's the thing this whole article is like because the guy is he's he's at arm's length where he's kind of like these people live in storm drains this is interesting but the people who live in the storm drains keep trying to make it sound okay but the more they try to make it sound okay they start revealing things of themselves and you go oh that's why you live in a fucking storm drain so this dude is like well uh yeah bob who was a hotel clerk at one of the many casinos here until he had a heroin problem that he couldn't kick but he swears he's been clean since january <laughs> sure he does that's what he's going to tell the reporter who's about to publish this story and could be because he also gave that reporter his fucking real name and let him take a picture of him living in a storm drain of course he wants one good thing in there about himself yes this is my face yes i live in a storm drain but i kicked heroin in january i promise <laughs> And then, the, but then they always throw these little offhand nuggets in that they, they think is just, you know, what they're doing is they're fleshing out the picture and they're also, the, it's a cute reporter's trick because they're letting you make your decision about the people. Rather than the reporter going, this is fucking awful that these people live in a storm drain, he's just going to give you the dragnet just the facts, ma'am, and then you, as you read them, you just go, oh, oh, no, oh. So because people are like, you know what, the storm drain's not so bad. We live down here, we have like a kitchen, a makeshift kitchen, and we have bookshelves. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's tough sometimes because, you know, when there are storms, it will flood down here, but it doesn't happen very often because we live in the desert and also you have to watch out for the very black widow spiders the very poisonous black widow spiders <laughs> wait a second hold on you're talking about your living space and uh and two of the main things you need to worry about are being flooded out after a rainstorm <laughs> And you have to worry about the presence, the never-ending presence, the uh, the omnipotent presence of Black Widow spiders, who will because it's a desert. They actually want to get out of the heat, so they go where you live. Doesn't that tell you something about your choice? You've chosen to live where the spiders live. I got news for you. If if you, the two main things that are, that are terrible about your dwelling are that it floods during a heavy rainstorm and uh, the the danger of black widow spiders, you are a snake. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Watch any ne- National Geographic special that you could possibly imagine about the desert, and they will show you that like these snakes live and they live in the ground and they tunnel underneath and they have to watch out because in the rains their their tunnels flood. And then when they come out to get escape the flood, there's a black widow spider waiting to bite them. <laughs> you are a heroin addicted snake. You actually, you would be better off if you were a snake because you wouldn't have had arms to fucking tie off to shoot heroin into yourself. Yeah, well, the only thing we need to worry about is it gets floods down here and then the, the dangerous, the extremely volatile fucking spiders who could crawl into the double bed we stole out of the dumpster. Your life is over! <laughs> Grab yourself by the Goodwill donated bootstraps <laughs> and join the rest of us uh, among the living, above ground. Quit trying to explain away living in the in the fucking sewer as if it's a good thing. It's so crazy. Because again, they d- just drop up these little facts. They're like... uh, you know, Tom, we would love to get a job and come up above the service. However, he has two outstanding warrants for drug possession charges that he had in the past. Well, Tom, it's time to face the fucking music. All right. You're sleeping with spiders. <laughs> and I guess maybe that's preferable to getting ass raped by by a convict by because you have to go in and give your time. But I, but it is it really is it really? I, I don't know. I, what would you rather have in your ass? A cock or fangs? Seriously. I mean, you're already used to shooting poison in your body as it is. I guess maybe that's why you're okay down there with the fucking spiders. You've geared up so much and cooked so much in your goddamn spoon, and then maybe you're immune to whatever black widows are going to shoot out of their fucking venomous fangs. I guess I guess it just matters what kind of injection you want. Needle fangs or cock. Two of them you live underground, one of them you live above ground. I guess it's your choice. I guess, I guess, uh, you know what? The odds have it. Why not? Go fangs and needle. Don't you realize how poorly you've made decisions in your life? 
if it comes down to the hat trick of needle fangs or cock. <laughs> God damn it. I'd, I'd rather be a Wookiee in Georgia than you, pal. Let me tell you that. Needle fangs or cock. That's not a choice anyone should ever have to make in their lives. <laughs> People live in storm drains. And, and like I said, it, it should tell you a little bit about where I'm at these days, that I'm actually reading these articles and going, can I live in a storm drain? I don't know if I could. I <laughs> I don't like spiders. Uh, and then, but, but then what's so funny to me is just you... You live in a storm drain, and then there's like, there's like, they said there's almost 700 people who live down there in a community. Uh, it, it's like a video game. Like, you would wander down and see those people, you know? And part of me wonders, what, you know, that would be, that's the kind of shit I would do as a kid. Like, I, you know, you would, like, get four people and then wander down among there and try to steal shit and beat people up or do weirdness. You know what I mean? That would be fucking hysterical. That's because it's, again, it's like a real life video game. And what are they going to do? Throw a spider at you? Fuck them. <laughs> Granted, there's 700 of them. You don't, you don't want to. Oh, man. Actually, yeah, if I went down there to like fight them and then they, I got caught, they would put me like in a stocks and rape me. Like that's because they can't they can't be having an active sex life down there underneath the fucking ground. Uh, who can get a hard on wondering about whether or not it's going to get bitten by a fucking spider at any moment? Why, why is my first thought to go down there and wreak havoc? I don't even know. It's like, because in my head, I'm like, would I be the king of the tunnels? Like, if I went down there and I was kind of funny? Uh, would our po- In my head, I'm like, would the po- where would we fucking the podcasting equipment if I had to move underneath into a storm drain? Where the fuck would I possibly go? Ah, uh, damn it. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I read that article. And then I read the article about this dude in Utah who lives in a cave. Uh, there's actually a book about him called The Man Who Quit Money. And uh, he's he's lived in a cave for twelve years, and he just he li- literally he lives in a cave in like Moab, Utah, and he goes out and scavenges cans and dumpster dives and lives that way, and and is content to do it. Uh, I, I, I why how how why? Because he, he obviously again he's not getting laid. He can't be getting laid, right? Because he's not going to go to all, even if he does scavenge enough cans to make money to go to a bar. And then he goes to a bar and he's like, "Hey, young lady, I, let me take you back to nature." Like, where the fuck is he bring her? He take. Hey, you ever get fucked in a cave? I mean, that's like the worst pickup line in history. It's very bad. Uh, well, hold on, it's the second worst pickup line in history, other than "Hey, ever been bitten by a black widow spider while you're getting fucked in a storm drain?" I can make that happen, honey. <laughs> And why, why do I go to getting laid either? I mean, it's like if you live in a fucking storm drain and you're, you're shooting up heroin and dodging spiders, you're not really thinking about getting laid at that point, are you? I wouldn't think so. But aren't we all thinking about getting laid at all times? Isn't that what we're thinking about every single fucking moment of our lives? That's why I couldn't go to a cave. So the only good thing in a cave is like you'd be like, well, there's like because there's that thrill of fucking outside. I'm a fan of fucking outside. Um but it's like you got to convince the other person to come back with you to the goddamn cave. And that's, again, that's just got to be a chore. I mean, I don't care how many drinks you get into a chick at the bar to go, no, really, come back and check out my cave. She's never coming back. I mean, that, you know, because, you know, he lives in the front of the cave, but, you know, he just goes to the back of the cave and throws the skulls down the, the, the bottomless pit that he discovered, right? And that's the thing is when they try to write these articles, they try to make these people sound like the ones who make sense. Oh, yeah, they decided to live in a storm drain because it's best for them. Hey, this guy gave up money, so now he lives it. It doesn't, he's eating refuse. This guy's eating like rotten vegetables, and they're like, well, we throw away so many vegetables, it's just a terrible waste in this country. Yes, fuck, I don't care. I don't want to eat the thrown away vegetables. I don't have to. I can go in and buy vegetables that are fresh. I don't need to wait out back for you to toss out the garbage, whether it's a fucking waste or not. I understand that it's bad, and we should be giving it to soup kitchens, whoever the fuck, but you, you aspire not to eat the rotten vegetables, right? Shouldn't that be your whole goal in life is to not ever have to eat the rotten vegetables? We all want to eat fresh vegetables. We want to eat local and organic and fresh. Nobody wants to go out back and have, I mean, if that's the case, just eat fucking grass. I mean, seriously, that's plentiful. That's everywhere. You don't even have to wait for them to throw it out the fucking back door. Go make a fucking grass soup. Eat tree bark. (laughs) If you can eat all that bullshit, then that's fine. I don't understand the logic of it. Oh, we waste so much in this country. Yes, we do because we can afford it because we're fucking America. All right. (laughs) America was founded on rotten vegetables and it's going to continue being that way. And if you want to live in a storm drain and dodge fucking spiders or you want to live in a cave and try to fuck girls with your fucking bad plantains, good for you. 
The rest of us will eat fucking uh, uh, apples that are fresh. Or you know, go find an apple tree. That's another thing, motherfucker. I understand if you're in Utah and you live in a cave and then you go, ah, I got to eat rotten vegetables. Go find, there's got to be like a vegetable patch or a fucking tree, like a wild lemon tree or some shit that you can go find, right? I'm, I'm out here in a, dude, move to California. There's caves here. Find a cave here. <laughs> God damn it, there's got to be like, like, because uh, we have plenty of trees and shit with fruit here. Shoplift. Go shoplift. <laughs> that, that, that's fine. Be an anarchist. I don't care if you want to be an anarchist. That's fine. But don't pretend that you like living in a cave and you, because again, then they have like that stack of books. Look, dude, how many times are you going to read the same books? Eventually, you're going to get to page 41 of a book you've read 400 times. You can look around and go, fuck, I live in a cave. Up, oh, time to go get some rotten lettuce. What the fuck? Kill yourself. End it. End it. <laughs> I don't believe in monetary gain and I don't believe. Well, then you know what? Then travel. Then go somewhere else. Be somebody. Do something. Change it. Don't just live in a fucking cave and not wash. Oh, you're filthy. <laughs> I don't know why I'm casting aspersions. If he wants to live in there with no money, good for him. It's, and he wants to eat rotten vegetables, but I just don't see the point. Uh, and maybe it's because I'm getting very close to having that happen. Because, you know, maybe this guy at the bed and breakfast was right. I shouldn't have bought that Vitamix because now I'm going to live in a fucking cave with just a blender. Where do I plug it in? Where the fuck do you plug a blender in? In a storm drain. Honestly. <laughs> And folks, you have no idea how close I am to finding out. <laughs> oh, if it weren't so. You live in a cave. You live in a storm drain. And you, you got to imagine, you know what? If there's 700 people living in storm drains under Las Vegas, elect five of them, because you've got, they have a typewriter, I'm sure, down there somewhere. They got all sorts of other bullshit. Type out a reality pitch. And make some fucking money. Because they were talking about how they make money down there. You know how they make money, folks? They go to the casinos and they do a thing called the, uh, the credit hunt, I think was what the term they use. Which means they look for drunk people who have left money in the machines. And they go, some guys, this guy's like, I found $500 in the machine once. And then I found, uh, you know, $99 a few times. He goes, usually you'll, you just, you'll try to get $20 a night. Uh, because then you can eat and everything will be fine. Uh, so these people are living on $20 a night that, that drunken people live behind upstairs. But you've got a typewriter. Get of the 700 of you, elect five, the five of you who can still type, uh, who aren't busy shooting up. The five of you who aren't busy fighting off spiders with flamethrowers. All right. While the others are holding off this, well, they're holding the spiders at bay. All right. You sit down at the typewriter and type out a reality show pitch about guys who live in a storm drain fighting spiders. How the fuck? That's a natural sell. That sells immediately. It was good enough for the Daily Mail or whoever the fuck. They wrote an article about it. Now it's just like, hey, we're heroin addicts who live underground and fight spiders. Jesus, you can at least get a video game pitch out of that, right? <laughs> Type it. Type it and come here. I will represent you. I swear to God. Meet me and I'll just cut me in for 50% of it because you guys aren't, you're living on shit anyway. You know what? As a matter of fact, cut me in for all of it. I'll give you each $20 a night because that seems to be the going rate for you motherfuckers. So type out this reality pitch about 700 heroin addicts who live under Las Vegas and fight spiders with flamethrowers and then bring it to me. That's uh, bring it right to me. I'll meet my many contacts here in Hollywood and I'll pay you $20 a night every night as long as it's on the air. All right. Does that work out? Because that seems like the going right for you motherfuckers. That seems to be what you guys, you make 20 bucks a night and you're happy. You said it right in the goddamn article. So 20 bucks, and by the way, not $20 a night for all 700 of you. That's fucking, that's too high. I'll, just for the five, the five the five guys who typed it, and then you can divide it with the other 700, however many fucking ways you want. So do that. Get the pitch together. Bring it to me. I will meet my many contacts here in Hollywood, and I will get this on the air. And when it's on the air, I promise, $20 a night for all five of you, and you divide it among the 700, however the fuck you want to. And I think we already know the name. Needles, fangs, or cock. This is the 40-year-old boy, and coming up later, Sabrina Vitale has tawdry beach sex, then beats your dumb ass in a street race. A Kickstarter reward. Here comes Todd Rush. do 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 here comes Tom Faust, and I say, let's be friends. Do 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 do. That was a Kickstarter reward. I wasn't allowed to sing on those, so I'll do it now.
<laughs> I'll back tag it with a special song. Kickstarter <laughs> reward. Actually, I do it this way. Kickstarter. <laughs> there you go. Chewbacca under a couch. He introduces the Kickstarter reward. Ah, uh, Georgia. All right. So, folks, uh, I want to sing. I would love to sing. We wouldn't, dude. If you could sing, singing would be amazing. Like, if I could sing, I would sing everywhere. And yet, you see people that go to karaoke and can sing, and you're pissed at them because you're like, dude, yeah, we get it. You can sing. But in reality, at karaoke, if somebody shows up who can really sing, let them fucking sing all night and just make it like their concert. But then they're not getting paid. I would do that. <laughs> Why do you shake your head? No. If I go to a karaoke bar and someone's really good. Uh, unless it's a dude, fuck a dude. But if it's a girl who can really sing, boom, let that girl sing all goddamn night and then we'll just all clap. I mean, it, it, let's turn this bullshit extravaganza where we have to listen to everybody indulge their nonsense into one woman's show. Why are you shaking your head no? Because karaoke in and of itself is, is a soup of crazy. Fuck soup of crazy. Well, then you just need to go, hey, we're having a karaoke night, but if you sing really well, it's going to be a one woman show. Come Done. On. Perfect. No. Yes, that's no. what it should be. This is how I think it should be. I, I demand it. I, do, I say if you go to karaoke and someone's good, like really good, a woman, not a man, fuck a dude. But if there's a woman who can really sing, then guess what? She gets to do all the songs the rest of the night and you guys can just drink and clap. That's it. All karaoke should be at, at, at any moment, at a moment's notice, all karaoke should turn into a concert at any moment. If someone's good enough who walks in, who can do it. If they're willing to give up their night and not get paid and just show off their talent and just get kudos, boom, they should be able to clean up and do the whole fucking thing. Because if I could sing, man, I would sing fucking everywhere. I'd be in Home Depot asking for, where are the boards? I mean, I'd just be like an asshole. Do they have boards at Home Depot? I think they do, right? That they What do they call it? Lumber? I don't know. Uh, where is the lumber? I would do. I would sing like a jackass. I would sing everything. I would sing directions. I would sing my phone message. If I could sing, I would sing like a motherfucker. And you'd be hate. You'd hate me because again, like I said, fuck a dude. But still, it wouldn't matter. I would sing in a grocery store. I wouldn't. It's like if I had a big cock. If I had a big cock, I wouldn't wear pants ever, ever. Are you shitting me? If I had a huge ho- a fucking hog, I would just. I would wear like tight shorts, and it, there would always be the the possibility of it peeking out the bottom of the shorts. I mean, I'd and I'd and I'd be proud of it. I'd be like, yeah, that's right. What if I could sing and I had a big cock? You would hate me. Holy shit! <laughs> God damn it, a hung guy who can sing. That's got to be your worst nightmare. Because he wanders into karaoke, he takes over the joint, and then everybody's like, wow, look at that hog. I mean, duh. Well, I actually, well, fuck a dude. I don't care if he's hung or whatever. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> But that's just the rules, man. If that's the way it is, you know, I, if someone's good at care, a woman's good at singing, she gets to take over a whole karaoke night. If you got a big cock, you don't have to wear pants. Don, these are I, I'm I'm making these laws, folks, based on the things that I would do. If I could sing, I would sing anywhere. If I had a big cock, I wouldn't wear pants. Done. It's like I, that's the rules. It's like all right. Here's another rule. If you're a massage therapist, you have to give hand jobs. That's it. That's your job. You can't file a lawsuit because somebody wanted a hand job because guess what? You're rubbing a naked person. You're very close to giving them a hand job. So you can't really be upset when they look at you and go, hey, how about a hand job? Because that's kind of what you're doing anyway. You're giving them a hand job, just not in the one area they want. You're, you're, you've given them a full body hand job. If you're a massage person, you have just given you. That's what you do. You give full body hand jobs. But you just don't give the release. So when the person says, hey, can I get a release? You can't run to a lawyer and sue that person. That person made Welcome Back Connor. You can't sue that guy. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be upset because he thought, because you know what? If anything, that's a compliment to the chef. That's like a compliment to you because it's a, you're doing such an amazing job. Your full body hand job was so amazing. They were like, you know what? Why don't you concentrate it right in this area here? How about it? There's towels around. You're not going to get any on you. I mean, I'll tell you where to point it so it doesn't get on you at all. I mean, it's it, they're being courteous. They're working out for you. They're taking it. Uh, they're taking the initiative. Oh my God. You're already giving full body hand jobs. What's wrong with the release? Why not? Especially if they say point it away or you, know, you got to make sure they're in the moment. I will tell you that if the person that requests release then does not tell you when release is occurring and then it gets on you, call the lawyer. All right, go ahead and call the lawyer at that point. But if just the mere suggestion of hey, give me a hand job, I, I don't. I think you're out of. I think you're out of line. Quite frankly. <laughs> I think because you know what that mer- that person requesting it made the movie Phenomenon. Did you see Phenomenon? It's a fucking brilliant movie. It's a genius movie. I actually watched Phenomenon, and I, in my head, I was like, "That's me." Like, I know that sounds stupid and weird, but it's like because I I get that look from people all the time where they're just like, "What the hell, that guy?" You know, that with the <laughs> who's that guy with the big dick singing karaoke? And I don't get that look ever. That's a look I would. Oh my god, I would pay every dime I ever make the rest of my life. I would pay for that look. Just to get that look from people like, who's the big dick guy who sings karaoke? Ah, that's me. Don't, don't you just wish that you, some things you just want to raise your hand to. Some things you wish you could just raise your hand and go, yep, guilty as charged. <laughs> I'm the guy with the big cock who sings great. God damn it. 
Why can't you be that guy? And I recognize some of those guys are out there and fuck a dude. I know. Get that. I don't care. But if some guy, if you're giving an, you're already giving a full body hand job, there's no reason for you to run to a lawyer when the person says, hey, why don't you put a finger in my ass? Quite frankly, it just shows it's a compliment. It's comes with the chef. It's like if you went and had a meal and you ate it and you're like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Please tell the chef I thought this was fantastic. Well, if you give a full body hand job and the guy's like, dude, put a finger in my ass. And he's like, you're like, what? And he's like, well, you're so good on the outside of my body. I can only imagine the wonders you could pull on the inside of my body. And all it is is a compliment to you and your abilities and your skills as an overall hand job giver, a full body hand job giver. That's what you are as a massage person, right? You get it. <laughs> Tell me you got, let's put it this way. You chose a profession where you can rub naked people. That says it all as far as I'm concerned. Cause what else are you, what are you doing? What are you I, as a kinesiologist or a fucking, I don't know what the reflexologist, whatever the hell you're, I don't know what you describe yourself as masseur, masseuse. You're a full body hand job giver. That's it. That's it. And done. Whether you're in a fancy spa or in a fucking Taiwanese hovel, you do the same fucking thing. And there's nothing wrong with getting a little out of you. You know what I'm saying? And by the way, that noise, that's Chewbacca trapped in a storm drain. I don't know if you know that. That's We've heard Chewbacca trapped under a couch in Georgia. If Chewbacca was trapped in a storm drain avoiding black widow spiders, that's him trying to tunnel out through the inch and a half of filthy fucking water that's under your stolen bed. You fucking junkie. Get a job. God damn it. I'm so close to joining them. That's the thing you people don't understand. I'm so close to living in a storm drain. I would be the king of the fucking storm drain. I'm hilarious. If only I could sing. If I showed up with my big cock singing in the middle of the storm drain, I'd be hailed as a hero. That'd be number, I'd be number 701. Certainly there's 700 people down there already making away. But if I show up big cock and fucking great singing voice, everybody's like, this guy's our king. God damn it. I don't get it. You already rub naked people. That was your choice. That was your career choice. You went to school and they said, what do you want to do? You said, I want to rub naked people all over their bodies. Nobody, because uh, what's your what's your desired goal? What's your end game? To get knots out of shoulders? Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> Nobody grows up going, oh, I can't wait to get a knot out of somebody's shoulder. <laughs> Fuck that. You fell into that because you are very close to jerking people off and you know it. Please. That's your job. It's like you're not even, when you went in, it, it, it should, you should have a degree in cock teasery. That's what you have. <laughs> Fuck reflexology or kinesiology. You have a, a, a cocktezology. That's what you are. You're a cocktezologist. <laughs> and you can't run to a lawyer because someone's wanted you to jerk them off. Because I don't know if you're aware of this. That guy was in Pulp Fiction. All right. That guy was in Pulp fucking Fiction. You can't sue him just because he wants you to touch his anus. <laughs> as it said in the lawsuit, which made me laugh. And my favorite thing is they're like, uh, they, they said that uh, he, Travolta got up and lumbered toward him with his erect penis going from side to side. And I'm like, uh, you're not supposed to do that at the massage place? Because I got to tell you, every massage I've ever had, I wound up lumbering around with my erect penis going from side to side. I don't know if that's something I'm supposed to be avoiding or, I mean, I guess if I was coming at somebody, that would be a different story. I'm usually going to get my pants and get the fuck out of there. But I mean... You guys, I guess you're, you're feeling a little trapped as, as uh, you know, the guy from uh, Michael <laughs> spread his angel wings and his legs and said, please touch my anus. I mean, I guess I could see where you think that would be some sort of uh, illicit request, but I'm sorry. Put yourself on the other end of your healing hands. If you were laying there getting all relaxed and then you got a heart on and it's like, well, this guy's good with his hands and he likes touching my ass. Flip it over. Boom. That's just my front ass. Go to work. <laughs> I need a little work done on my front ass. And I'll tell you where to point it so you don't get any on you. But even if you do get it on you, again, sheets, towels, you're already covered in oil. What the fuck? Honestly, that was your career choice. You chose to be covered in oil and rub a naked dude. You can't file a lawsuit. That guy was in The Punisher. Oh, my God. Ugh. And maybe I'm a little biased. Maybe I like John Travolta and maybe I don't think that you should go ahead and go after him because he's John Travolta for fuck's sake. I mean, it, again, there, there's some things you do. If you if you can sing, you should be able to sing anywhere you want. If you've got a big cock, you don't have to wear pants. If you're John Travolta, everybody should have to jerk you off. That's it. <laughs> That's a story you tell. I don't know what your end game is. Are you trying to get some money out of him or are you going to sue Scientology at the end of it? I mean, and, and, and Albert, actually, Albert Brooks made me laugh because yesterday everybody else is like, Travolta, ha, ah, gay, whatever the fuck. And Albert Brooks just typed his on Twitter. He just wrote, you'd think Scientology had their own spa, <laughs> which is fucking gorgeous and understated and perfect. And, and, and when you get to it, yes, he's absolutely right. Why do they not? 
It's Scientology. How much money do they fucking have? They should have a hand job room. I've been in the Scientology building because they want you to go ahead and they go through all the. I, I I told you I took the personality test and all that bullshit. And when it looked like they were losing me, they had the hot chick come in to try to close me. So would she have jerked me off? Quite frankly, if I'd have gone for it, because I mean, it seems to be that's the mo with those people. Why not? So if she's gonna jerk me off, why didn't she jerk Travolta off? And I granted Travolta, and uh, and it's funny because there's like, uh, and now this is all right. Two people filed lawsuits this week, but there are dozens of stories about Travolta. I, I, I mean, John, <laughs> get a get a concubine or a boyfriend or I mean, uh, you know, uh, buy Neverland. You know what? Just buy Neverland, but just invite massage guys. I mean, it's like. Avoid kids and just buy Neverland and invite massage guys. They'll go on the Ferris wheel and you'll feed them popcorn and then it'll be just like an eight-handed jerk-off, four at a time. Keep it on the QT. Keep it on, keep it quiet, Barbarino, honestly. Just have Neverland and a bunch of massage dudes there because then they know what they're in for. They know that when you strike that pose, they grab your rubber hose. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, God damn it. I, I, uh, look, maybe I'm on the wrong side of this. I don't know. That's for you to decide. But I just feel that you've already made a life choice that you're going to rub naked guys when a famous one of them comes in and says, jerk me off. That's your obligation. <laughs> if you don't like it, there's plenty of room in the storm drain. Just pack up your... I'm sure they need one of you. Down there, they've got 700 of them fighting a war against the spiders. I'm sure they get a crick in their neck every once in a while. Go down there and massage some heroin addicts if you want to go ahead and live your life as a professional. Fuck that. Sometimes a cock just needs to be jerked off when you're in your line of work. It just has to happen. All right. Uh, It has to happen in all lines of work, by the way. You think I like it when it happens to me? No. But when I, I'm, I work as a security guard in a quiet, dark place, and sometimes people show up and they're like, hey, you got to do this. I got to do it to keep the building safe. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, I like John Travolta. Back off. I don't need you to, to be mad at me. I just, I just love the wording of it. And, and again, th- here's the thing. If you said John Travolta approached you and whatever the fuck and you're in your lawsuit, that's fine. But then they, they always embellish with like these crazy things that... That can't be true. But even even if they are true, they make no sense and they ruin your lawsuit because they sound untrue. It's like, all right, I can actually believe that John Travolta came in and then whipped it out and said, hey, jerk me off. And you were like, no, I pray tell. And you got the vapors and you almost fainted. That's fine. Good for you. Even though you used to see a naked cock all day long, that's your job. But that's fine. Uh, but you act that Travolta's one illicit request. I'm sure that's the first illicit request you've ever gotten. As you learned, you, I'm sure you learned you were on Sunnybrook Farm, you and Rebecca, and you were learning massage in the barn on the animals. And then your parents were like, well, don't go to the big city. You don't know what kind of hand jobs are lurking. And you're just like, oh, ma, it'll be just as easy as it was here on the farm. And then you make your way to the big city and you get a job at a fancy French spa and you massaged a million people and nothing bad ever happened until evil John Travolta came in and forced you to look at his cock. All right, fine. Maybe that happened. I can almost believe that. But then in the in the actual lawsuit, the guy said that Jafolta started yelling at him about Hollywood Jews and Jews ran Hollywood and they forced him to have gay sex and that this guy would learn to like it like this weird the, the paranoid delusional ravings of a guy who stares at cocks all day. Quite frankly, that's what it sounded like to me. Uh, so it just invalidated his complete lawsuit because although when you go this way, maybe it was a brilliant idea by Travolta. Maybe Travolta actually started screaming about a Hollywood Jews who made him gay. And then this guy should be gay as well. And, he, and then he's also screaming at the guy. Like uh, they said that the guy said that Travolta said he wasn't even gay when it started, but then he started having sex and he, the, he made millions of dollars. And so he was, he learned to be cool with it. Um, but, but is that threat implicit with telling the massage guy, eventually he's going to make millions of dollars by doing this? <laughs> Jerk me off. Eventually, it will lead to a million dollar empire where you'll own your own jet. That's basically what he's saying. And not only will you own your own jet, you'll have your own jet. You'll have a kid named Jet and a jet. You will be so if you jerk me off now, eventually you'll marry Kelly Preston and you won't want anything to do with her. (laughs) All right. Uh, So the fuck was I talking about? I swear there was something I was talking about earlier. And I can't remember what the fuck it was. Once we started fighting spiders, I lost my mind. What was it? Do you know? Brody. Way at the beginning. Brody. We were talking Brody about Stevens. Yes. Ah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we started talking about... Well, I covered Brody, though. Brody. I think I covered it. No, you never, you never said what the two of you talked about. 
ever. Okay. Or why you were even talking. With yeah, that's true. Where I met him. All right. So all right, here's the thing. Uh, so Brody's been doing these things with Neil Hamburger. Oh, that's what it was. Neil Hamburger. I was going to talk about that. All right, folks. This is the perils of not having a, fir- a friend here to talk to. This is me just talking. <laughs> And eventually, you know, sometimes you're talking about talking to your friend Brody and eventually you start talking about jerking off John Travolta. It just gets there. And in the interval, you fight spiders with flamethrowers. That's how it works on this show. You know it and I know it. Jump on board. Saddle up that spider and ride with me into the storm drains. We're clearing them out. Maybe that's what I do. I, you know what? I Maybe I become the king of spiders. If I can control the spiders, I can control the storm drains. And then I'll control the earth. <laughs> I lead the spiders in their war against the junkies. Meanwhile, up above, the 1% looks down from their Eiffel Towers. And they stare at the rest of the the 99% of us fighting spiders with flamethrowers and shooting heroin underground. (laughs) And then telling the paper it's great. (laughs) I love the rationalization. It's my favorite part. All right, so. No, it's not bad down here. It's okay. Other than the venomous spiders and the inch and a half of feces-filled water we have to trot through to get to our makeshift shower. You know what's and that's funny, spiders and feces filled water and everything. You know what you know what I fear most underneath? Conversation with the other six hundred and ninety nine people who live in a storm drain. Jesus Christ. If you're willing to look on the bright side of life for, from that, I don't want to talk to you. If you're if you're look, there's seven hundred of you. You can be a hive mind for change. If you just get together and go, hey, why don't we get the fuck out of this storm drain and avoid the spiders? Is heroin that b- much of a fucking lure to keep you down there? If so, you know what? All of you share a fucking needle and die. That's a grim note, probably, as I rooted. I was earlier. Well, actually, I was going to charge in there as the king of the spiders and take them over. So what the fuck do I care if they die? I hope they do die so I can slip in there and steal their beds. Their fancy beds. All right. Uh, there was something there. What was I talking about? Brody and Neil. Brody and Neil. Uh, so I was talking to Brody. I saw Brody at, uh, at Jimmy Pardo's pilot taping, um, which was Thursday, I think, last week. <laughs> and uh, I, I saw Brody there and he was working warm up. I didn't get to talk to him uh, beforehand, but I talked to him after. By the way, and uh, Pardo's pilot was great. It was so good. And it's so funny. I'll tell you this. It um, it actually reinforced why, I'm, why I don't do stand up anymore. Why I, I, because I, uh, I do the one man. And when I do that, I do it, it, it goes very well. People are very nice and they allow me to be indulgent and do the things that I want to do. But, uh, Watching Pardo's show, man, he it's a show where he has comedians come on and they actually perform like little five minute sets and then writers write about them and it, blah, blah, blah. But uh, when I saw the guys do comedy on the fucking show, I, in my head I went, I can't, I could never, I can't ever go back to comedy. Like it was this weird, I've already talked myself out of doing it anyway. Do it. I don't do it really. At I do. The open. Uh, what, I do what at the open? You do- not really. I talk about what I did on the plane. I mean, that's not the same thing. I mean, it's 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 indulgent because it's not tightened and honed. If I went up on stage at that show and did did what I wanted to do, I mean, it's five minutes. I mean, fuck, what the fuck do I do in five minutes? I couldn't. Even, I, we're still trying to get to Brody for fuck's sake. I talked about Brody what an hour ago, and now we're still digging around looking for Brody. Uh, so th- that's what I'm saying. It's like I I I love this. This is my niche, and I love doing it. But it's so antithetical to what stand up is or could be. Um. <laughs> Because here's the, you know, the, the difference is, uh, it's the difference between a guy who can handle himself in a scrap and a professional fighter. That's what it is. Because you know what? If I show up and if I'm in a fight, I could hurt somebody pretty bad if I, if I landed. That's the thing. I would, I would square up and if I was able to land a shot on someone, I could probably hurt them. Because I got a big fucking, you know, big hand and I mean, I, I can generate some, I'm a big guy. But I would just, in the meantime, just be flailing in the dark as this guy picked me apart with jabs and dominated me because he's a professional. I watch professional comedians at that taping, and I realized just how far I am from being a professional comedian again. Because uh, I was one for the longest time. I worked stand-up. I worked the road. I did those things. And it's a skill you need to keep doing in order to be good at it. And so that's why I keep telling myself, boy, I need to go do stand-up again. But then I see those guys, and they are so far ahead of me. I mean, it's just it, – there was a guy – Pete Holmes went up. We all know Pete Holmes. Um I've met Pete once. He wouldn't he would know me if he saw me. But uh, on Jimmy's show, he was fucking hysterical. He was so good. Uh, and then Shane Moss went on after him, and he was great. And then the second taping, uh, as good as Pete and Shane were, okay, the second taping was uh, a guy named Julian McCullough, who I don't know. 
I don't know Julian, never met him, never seen him. I've heard the name, don't know anything about him. He goes up and uh, and he was staggeringly good. I mean, like it was, he was so funny and quick and sharp. And then they do this thing because there's a, uh, at the end, the, the writers have to write jokes about your set and then you kind of roast one another back and forth. And Julian was, he was the funniest guy on the stage. Uh, I, I mean, he just, he was, he was jumping all over their bits and coming up with his own bits because his stand-up was great but then when, when he sat down for the banter part god damn was he funny and even worse he's really good looking so you're like oh, so you know who he is he's fucking great singer big dick guy that's who he is because he's really good looking and extremely funny and good at what he does and you're just like oh no that's that's not fair that's not fair at all go live in a storm drain make it fucking you know what? That's what I should do. I should go and be the king of the people in the storm drain and just have them do my bidding and kidnap like good looking people who are great at stuff. So eventually it gets down to where I could wander in and my mediocrity could actually stand out. I need to kidnap and take care of all of the really good comedians. So eventually they'll just look at me and go, well, you're left and I'll go, fine, let's do this. And then I'll change the paradigm of stand up comedy because right now it's all clean jokes and well-written punchlines and some callbacks and really sharp writing. And instead, why don't you just get me who will talk for two hours until he finds a funny thing and never complete a thought. Literally, let's let's just hire fucking ADD and jeans. So, uh. So Julian McCullough was just fantastic, and and I was and I uh, we went I was sitting with Pat and Chip and Karen was there too. We brought Karen, and and she was just like this guy's funny, and I'm like yeah he is, you know, and 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 it's that paying. There's a great line in Mad Men this week, um, and it, it was so funny I related to it. Don Draper's wife Megan. And I'm not spoiling anything. Well, yes I am. I am spoiling something. If you didn't see Mad Men this week, stop listening. Uh, Don Don Draper's wife Megan. She wants to do something else. And so she comes to him to tell him. And she said, uh, I, see, I have to tell you what she did. Spoiler alert. Uh, she wants to be an actress. And she stopped being an actress to work with Don at, uh, at the, the firm. But now she's decided she wants to be an actress again. And she tells Don, you know, the thing is, I don't even want to go to the theater anymore. Because all I feel, instead of feeling good for my friends, is I feel envy. And I know that after envy will become bitterness. And, and I, I heard that line and I got chills because that's exactly how I feel about comedy clubs because I, I missed it. I've said it many times. I missed the boat on it. I, I stopped working it and I never got anywhere with it uh, and not where I thought I should have been. And so when I go to clubs and I, I see people, I can't even laugh. Like I want to laugh and enjoy it. And I want to have fun. But part of me always, the wheels are turning that I should be doing this. I should be fucking doing this. And my anger and rage at myself comes out while I'm sitting there. So at Pardo's Pilot... It was great. I'm happy for Jimmy and I'm happy for all the people that are involved and my friends Matt and Boris created it and you're, you're always excited for them but at that same time and you're, you've got that faraway voice in your head that says you should be doing this. Uh, not, 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 not their show but I mean I should be doing a show because I remember when I was working on like Starface or on, on Funniest Pets and People and you would be well, you know on Starface especially you'd be on the set and you'd see your jokes come to life as you know granted Danny Bonaducci stomped all over them but still they came out and, uh, and then you saw your trivia questions, things like, and you, we were hanging out at craft service and you're kind of, you, you got to go with the script backstage. It was just, it was life and it was vibrant. It's what I want to do. Um, but I've missed it. I can't do it. Nobody knows the fuck I am. I completely, I've, I've burrowed into a stripper's kitchen and this is where all my funny lives. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I, I wish it wasn't true. I uh, periodically, I will pack up a trunk, a steamer trunk of funny and I'll take it to a city and you folks will watch me and be kind enough to let me unpack it all over your stage for three hours. And then I'll pack it back into my steamer trunk and hop back on the plane and come back on Saturday night and shovel fucking garbage. So, uh, and that's my fault. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, but, but it doesn't change the fact that when I go to a comedy club and I want to start doing stand up, and then I sit there and they don't know who I am. That's the things I have to re audition for people. They don't know that I'm good at it or if I was ever good at it. Cause that's the thing I am. I am and I was, but not like these guys. After fucking Julian McCullough went up, Tommy Jonigan went on. Tommy Jonigan's done Letterman like four times. And I remember watching him on Letterman. I'm like, that guy's funny. Uh, I was, you know, I liked him. He was very Midwest and very funny. Uh, seeing him live for five minutes made me realize I'm not even I'm not even the same fucking stratosphere as that guy as a comedian. I mean, he just he was crushing and I don't think he breathed the entire five minutes and just hammered everybody with funny. It's the, and Karen could not stop laughing. She would laugh over and over at everything he said. And she looked at me. She said, this guy is hysterical. And I'm like, he is. He's I can't. You're helpless in the face of greatness. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. And just and also when you want to be that. 
and you watch it unfold in front of you and you realize that you can't be that. You're like, oh my, f-. but but I could. That's the thing is I could and I have and I've been funny on stage and I've been, I, but could I be funny in four minutes and pack a punch like he did? I don't know. I have no idea. But at the same time, do I want to do that? Do I want to be funny in four fucking minutes? I have no idea if I do or I don't because part of me is like, well, why can't I be the guy who goes out and does three hours and makes people laugh? Well, because nobody wants to fucking see that, idiot. That's why. <laughs> We've talked about this many times in your, I'm sorry I opened the trap door on my fucking head. Um, but watching the pilot really drove home how far away I am from getting back into comedy. Like, I keep saying it like, well, I got to start doing stand-up again. Like, I can just go and start doing clubs and open mics again. Well, no, there's, there's an entire generation of comedians ahead of me who've passed me. And, uh, and rightfully so. They've worked at it and they're good. So I don't think I could fucking hold a candle to those guys. And and what I need to do is start honing it and start sharpening it and make it funny and make it work because I can do it and I did it in the past. Uh, and I got to try to find a way to marry what I do on here and telling stories about me and my life with what I do regarding like topical stuff. That's what I used to do on stage before. But is that even funny because it doesn't interest me anymore? It's like there's even parts of the one man that I, I find don't ring true. They ring hollow in my head and they're in there and I haven't taken them out yet, but I still do them. But I shouldn't. I shouldn't do them because they don't really relate to who I was, who I am now. They were they were true when I wrote them. Certainly when I wrote the show two years ago, these things made sense. But now I think I've passed these thresholds and I don't need them in there anymore. But taking them out would be, you know, that would just be work, folks. I'd have to do <laughs> that means if I took them out, I'd have to replace them with something. But you know what's funny? I would not have to replace them with anything. It would just mean a three hour show was a two hour and 53 minute show. What the fuck? <laughs> Take seven minutes out, dipshit. But I can't. Why? But why would I do that? All of my stuff is gold and you all need to see it at all times. I need it. I, I'm carrot top. All right. I'm carrot top. I wheel my big fucking thing of props on stage and I'm not done till that fucking trunk is empty and I can walk the fuck off. That's who I am. But it's my life in that trunk. I unpack all of it until it's all fucking exhausted and you are just sitting there covered in my life. It's as if it's like I came in. You know what the one man show is? I came in for a massage, folks. I came in for a massage and I lay down on stage naked and all of you just rub your hands all over me until eventually you're covered in my life. And I warn you, and you should be happy for it. And you guys are happy. You actually pay for the privilege. A masseur, he gets paid and he gets pissed off because he's got to jerk a guy off. Fuck that. You're making money. The people who come to my show, they pay for the privilege to come in and rub all over me and just get my life shot all over them. And they just sit there and marinate in my life for three hours. And then eventually I leave. And then I come back home and Saturday night, I shovel garbage. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, but, but I mean, watching those guys do comedy, it really drove home just how fucking far I am from being a comedian, not, not a comedian from being them. Uh, and do I want to be them? No, but you know what I mean? I want to go back on stage. I want to be funny in short bursts and, and, uh, I, I, I want to make money at this. I want to be, I want to make a living out of it. I, I, I how, cause I want good news. I want to bring you guys good news. I've talked about this before. How great is it going to be when I come here one time and tell you that I actually have a cool job doing something great. It's like when I got the audition for life and times of Tim, right? I just got hired for it. It was just great to tell you. I did a voiceover for an HBO show out of the blue. It was fucking cool. Um, because it's funny, I used to tell you guys, if you guys would bought year one or year two or year three, you'd hear audition stories. Like I would go and audition for a TV show or a commercial. When was the last time I told you one of those? Because I don't go anymore. I mean, my agents are, it's a ghost town over there. And I mean, I don't, I wanted to get new agents. And I told you, I sent stuff to like 30 different agencies and I didn't hear back. And it's just, it's just, everything is, I'm sitting still and everything else is still moving. And I'm, I'm trying desperately to get on the fucking train again, which I will, I think. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but when I went to the pilot the other night, it was great because I got to be in a comedic atmosphere. It wasn't great because there was that pang of jealousy and envy and bittersweet in my stomach. I won't lie. I mean, I was really excited and happy for my friends, but at the same time, you, in your brain, you're like, I, I can do this. Why can't I do this? Um, and it's because I can't get out of my own way enough to do it. And also people don't know who the fuck I am and I don't go out enough. And I just, I, I, I again, I refuse to take my funny out of the stripper's kitchen. So, um, there was something else about Pardo's pilot. You were talking with Brody. Brody. <laughs> okay. That's right. Um, my friend Brody was there. Brody Stevens. We talked about him earlier in the show. Go ahead and rewind it. Uh, you might find his name. Uh, idiot. And so Brody was there doing warm up. And I talked to him afterwards. And uh, I swear to God, I've talked about this. I, I, did I say this or not? I so. You don't think so. That's funny. I don't think so either. Um, no, I think so, but who cares if I'm repeating myself? What the fuck? Who cares? Yeah. Again, uh, this is what you got yourselves into folks. 
this is this explains more about why I'm not on stage because I can't do a fucking stand up for any length of time without repeating a story. And then everybody's like, what the fuck? Didn't you just say this? I think I did. Maybe. I don't know. What was I talking about? That's another thing. People frown on when you do live stand up. What was I talking about? What was that? Where are we at? I can't bring Lily to every gig. <laughs> Although that actually that would actually be a really funny gimmick. If you came with me and dressed like a hot secretary with like total heels and you came up on stage with me with just like glasses and big tits and fucking and your legs crossed and pretended to take dictation the entire time with your and just sat there, you know, kicking with your shoe hanging off your foot. Oh, sexy. And just and I'll just do stand up and we'll never acknowledge you. And then finally, when I finally run into a wall, at like the 25, what the fuck was I talking about? And you just go, you like flip through the pages and you go, Brody. And I go, oh, yeah, Brody. And, let, and that, it will pay off huge. I'm telling you, that would actually get a huge, huge laugh. That would pay off monstrous. If you if you never if you just came out and sat there the entire time and went never acknowledged you nobody knew what the fuck was going on they were waiting and I did twenty five minutes of stand up oh how fucking great is that idea you're just like hot and dressed up in a, like a man's white dress shirt and a black skirt with black hose I haven't thought about this much <laughs> wow this sounds like something I've been thinking about a long fucking time but it's not I swear I just thought of it now. Uh, but yeah, man, if you had like a man's white dress shirt on and like a black skirt and black uh, hose and then like your heels and one heel hanging off your foot and you're just like t- taking dictation and you're fucking and your hair and pin curls and fucking glasses. Oh, God damn it. All right. And uh, and even though you can't come to every town, perhaps in every town I could put an ad in Craigslist and find an actress to play your part. <laughs> must must have 44 D. 26 36 and must be willing to sit there and not say a word for 20 minutes and it must actually be able to take dictation i'm sure you can find those in every city all right uh so you were talking to brody talking about brody <laughs> you should flip the pages <laughs> Uh, so I'm talking to Brody. He's, he was there doing warm up, And then afterwards I went up to him and I'm like, Hey dude. And, uh, I asked how he was, cause he's been, he's been in Austin. I, cause I wanted, I'm curious to hear how other people are doing it when they go on the road. Cause I do the thing where I book the theater, I fly, I do everything myself. So, uh, I knew he'd been doing some on the road gigs with Neil Hamburger and he'd been going to see, he was in Seattle at Chop Suey. Uh, he's going to Wichita. He's going to Austin. Uh, and he was in Austin at the Moon Tower Comedy Festival. And I'm like, how'd that go? He goes, good. And I said, well, your tweets made it sound like you were in a bunch of different shows. He goes, yeah. And he was in Portland, too. Um, and they used him in like a lot of different shows because Brody's a guy you can just plug in. I mean, he's just going to be funny no matter. It could be a hipster show or a regular comedy show. Brody's going to go in and just fucking crush it. So uh, so he's like, I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, well, you know, I'm looking at getting a podcast going and doing uh, this. And I said, oh, uh, I said, you know, you had a podcast, right? He goes, yeah. Uh, and he goes, I, I, I need to change it. I need to do something different because he had gotten a lot of hate, I guess, from the community, the podcast community, not, not the podcast community, from people who listened. All right. Not the podcast community. Yes, it was <laughs> Kevin Smith showed up at Brody's house. Brody, stop doing that podcast immediately. <laughs> Snoochie Boochie. And they ran away. Uh <laughs> Because uh, Jay and Silent Bob tell you not to do a podcast. That's actually that's actually a new podcast right now on the Kevin Smith Network. Jay and Silent Bob tell you not to do a podcast. Uh, <laughs> but it's funny because I told Brody, I go, I listened to your first, because I did, I listened to his first podcast, and it was over two hours, and literally he would get up from the microphone and walk away and still talk. And he had two other guys on microphone, but then he would walk around the studio and just be talking about stuff, and, and you couldn't hear him, and he would wander off, and it was just it was just an odd melange. I mean, it was just like a weird thing. And I even said to him, I go, yeah, I, I did hear it. And he started laughing, and he goes, yeah, it was, he goes, I misjudged it. He goes, because I thought it was going to be something different, you know, and I, I, I didn't realize the audio aspect, because I guess there was also video, and he played to that more than the audio. Uh, but now he's looking at doing another podcast. And I was like, well, that's great. And he's like, uh, you ever do a podcast? <laughs> I said, yeah, Brody, I've, uh, I've actually been doing one for, I'm in the fifth year of my podcast now. <laughs> He's like, wow, seriously? I said, well, I've been doing it six years. I said, I did a year with Jimmy on uh, Never Not Funny, and then I, I actually started my own show a year later. And he's like, wow, how's that going? And I said, oh, it's going good. I said, I, you know, I book myself on the road, and I do a lot of, uh, um, oh, wait, you know, I want to talk about Neil Hamburger. Oh no, because there's there's a there's a point to this. I apologize. Hold on. Uh, so, because uh, I asked Brody, because Brody's on the road with Neil Hamburger and he's doing stuff. And if you don't know who Neil Hamburger is, he is a guy who uh, he purposely bombs. I think I was telling you this earlier, and uh, and I don't get it all the time. I'll be truly honest with you. I mean, I'll watch it, and it, but the thing is, of course. Uh, the crowd loves it. Like they go crazy. Woohoo! Yay! He's so funny because he's not funny at all, and it's like. <laughs> Because that's what he's trying to do. And I guess if you're into it, that's fine. But once it goes past like 
10 minutes, you're going, oh, I, for me, again, I'm, I'm an idiot. All right. Maybe I don't get it. But, uh, because I will tell you this, the first time I ever discovered Neil Hamburger was I was on the road with my friend, Mike Toomey back in Chicago. I may have said this before. We were at a fucking Goodwill store and we found a tape a comedian named Neil Hamburger. We're like, what the fuck is this? So we bought it and we put it in the car in the tape deck and it was him live at a day's in somewhere in like Fresno. And this is when he would do shows in front of real crowds and bomb on purpose and tape them. And we we're listening to it and we, we were fucking dying at how funny it was because because he kept doing this, that's my life. Like he kept doing this weird thing. And it's funny because now I see him and he does that. He coughs all the time i don't remember him coughing so much in the cassette tape because now it drives me crazy when he coughs i'm just like oh and also i will tell you this hearing him on the tape was completely different because it was just hearing him bomb and bombing and we knew he was bombing purposely and we could not stop laughing in the car at how great it was but then when you see him live and you see him in the tux and he's purposely uglied himself up to in in such to such a degree where his hair's all pasted down with like pomade and he's got those thick glasses and he's like oh, and he coughs up phlegm and i'm like i i can't be in the room i can't even be in the fucking room and again that says more about me than it does about him because he's crushing people love him and he's a genius and that's great i i can't handle it i because i keep he's coughing and i'm looking at him and it's just it's too weird for me like i can't i can't look past it because he never betrays the fact that he's that he there's no wink. All right. There's no wink in Neil Hamburger. He's just going to keep being unfunny for the entire set until he's done. And then he's going to walk off. There's no there's no. All right, everybody. And, he, and there's no Clark Kent moment where he just takes off the glasses and it's like, hi, I'm super comic. No, no. He's Clark Kent all the way through the fucking thing. And you're uncomfortable as fuck. And then he walks off. And that's the point. I get it. I get that. That's the point. It's just that my stomach can't take it. <laughs> It was better in the car when I could hear him and just be like, this is hysterical than to be in the room live when it's happening. And I will tell you this, uh, that this is weird. I know this is going to sound strange. If I could see Neil in a room of people who had no idea who the fuck he was, I'll bet I would love it. I'll bet I would fucking love it. But unfortunately, whenever I saw him, I've seen him twice here and it's in a room full of people who are conditioned to love Neil Hamburger and his shtick. So the, his anti comedy of trying not to be funny is almost being ruined by a hipster crowd who want to prove how much they're into it and how much they get it, so they over laugh at everything he fucking does. And again, that's only two times that I've seen him. All right, I, I can't, I can't speak to other performances, and I'm not, I'm certainly not uh, denigrating what he does. What he does is so hard and amazing to do. But it's just, uh, I guess maybe it's more to me about the people who are trying to prove how much they love it and how much they get it, so they laugh their asses off at it. When in reality, that's kind of not what it is. I don't know. I'm an idiot. Why am I talking about this? Um, so I talked to Brody. This was nothing. This is just an anecdote. I don't even know why we even came back to it. Uh, when I told Brody I do the podcast and I go on the road and he's just like, what? And he, he told me, he says, uh, he's doing these sets on the road. And he said, he, uh, he goes, yeah, I do them. And I, they're like, you know, 30 minutes. And he goes, I'm doing, he said he's doing Wichita, I think in June. And he's like, he goes, I'm going to start headlining clubs. And I'm, I go, that's awesome, dude. And he's like, yeah, I'm trying to get my hour set together. And, uh, cause he, he can do, you know, he can do whatever he asks probably, uh, normal time like normal people comedy time. <laughs> if you said to him, do an hour, he could do an hour, but he's putting it together. He wants to say, but he wants to have a strong hour. You know what I mean? Cause, uh, <laughs> fuck, I mean, I can, I can do an hour. I can talk to you guys for an hour, but is it necessarily a strong hour? That's for you to decide. <laughs> Uh, but Brody's like, I'm putting together a strong hour and getting my club work and getting that squared away. And I go, Oh, good. He goes, when you do these shows, so like, like people come, you sell tickets. I go, yeah. And he goes, well, how many? I go, I go, you know what? If I can sell 50 tickets a city, I feel comfortable about it. Um, but I, I try to find the cities that are going to support me. And I, I go, I've, I've lost money in some cities and in some cities I've made more money. I said, I did a Kickstarter and he's like, what's that? And I explained it to him where you guys were nice enough to donate some cash. And I put four cities down and I was able to come to town with the shirts and everything. He's like, that's amazing. And I said, yeah, it's, it's really kind of cool. And he goes, well, how long's your show? I said, well, it varies. It's, it's kind of, it's weird. I go, you're going to, you're going to think it's stupid. And he's like, what? And I go, it's, uh, I go, you know, I was just in Cleveland last week and it was, uh, it was three hours on the nose. And Brody, Brody Stevens is always Brody. He's always kind of like a character. You know what I mean? He's kind of being, he's in character. And uh, I think I actually saw the, the, the Brody costume crack for just a second. Cause I said, yeah, I did. I did three hours in Cleveland and he made a face. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> three hours on stage. And I said, yeah. And he goes, and you, and you talk the whole time. Like, do you have a movie or like, what do you do? And I'm like, no, I, 
Like if there was a, he thought it was like a whole presentation and I'm like, nah, dude, it's just me talking. And he's like for three hours, I go, yeah, I go the podcast. Actually, I go, when I started doing the show, it was only 20, 30 minutes. And now I'm in the fifth year and I've done shows. I did a show that was three and a half hours long just a couple of weeks ago. I said, I've done shows regularly over two hours and then, and then some over three. And he's like, but what do you, what do you talk about all that time? And I'm like, I don't know. I really don't. I said, I just talk. I just, I talk until I'm done. I go, you know what? Sometimes it's an hour. Sometimes it's two. Sometimes it's three. It's just, if I, I go, if I go out of town, I got a lot of stuff to talk about, but if I don't, then I'm going to wind up talking about fighting spiders with flamethrowers and junkies in the fucking <laughs> storm drains of Las Vegas for five hours. I mean, who knows? Who the fuck knows? And, uh, it was just, he was so alarmed when I told him that it was over three hours. Like he just, it just his face, almost like he wanted to tackle me and save me from that horrible fate. And, uh, or, or he wants to fly to the city ahead of me, a day ahead of me, and warn them of what's coming. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, it was just it was funny to see his face. So, so I will say this: when I did that, it kind of gave me a little boost. Like maybe I'm doing something other people aren't doing, or maybe I'm doing something that people can't do. You know? And uh, but but it was I'll tell you what: it was never driven home more severely than that night how far away I am from being a comic again I mean it's just I it's the difference between watching a professional boxing match and going and seeing a drunken tough man match in a, in a bar and just seeing dudes swing at one another until somebody falls because that's what I do basically I show up in town I unpack my steamer trunk of funny that I had packed at the stripper's kitchen and then I just uh, I, I just swing at one another I swing until somebody falls and I shoot my life all over the audience that's how it works the entire audience gets together and gives me a, a full on hand job full body hand job and then I shoot my life all over them and I just swing until somebody falls uh, there's a lot of metaphors for what I do and none of them are good none of them are good <laughs> seriously at the end of all of them everybody winds up sweaty or sticky I, I don't like that I, it's just that's not a good endorsement for my show. At the end of my show, you're either going to wind up sweaty or sticky. That's bad, right? Uh, or maybe I should, you know what? I should call it the sweaty and sticky tour from now on. It's no longer success is not an option. It's the sweaty and sticky tour. Uh, I like it. Actually, I do like that. Holy shit, do I like that. Especially if you're coming on the road with me and doing the dictation thing. Uh, and then we can wear shirts. I'm sweaty. She's sticky. Uh, Brody. Brody. Oh, well, we've covered it. Cross it out. Mrs. Hotchkiss. Um, all right. So, uh, so yeah, I talked to Brody and it was just amazing to see real comedy, which I haven't seen in a long time. I mean, I've seen it on TV. You watch guys, I watch Paul F and people like that, but to go live and, and see it work in a room where people are actually laughing. And, and again, I, I'm not saying that I don't get laughs and do that on the one man. It, the one man is, it works really well. I'm just saying to see di it's different. Stand up comedy is different. And to see it in small five minute bursts in front of an audience, it's just completely different. And it makes me wonder if I could pull it off. I think I could. Uh, I'd, I'd have to work at it though. And who the fuck wants to do that? Um, but I will say this, it, I, I see those guys and in my head, I'm like, God damn, I can't believe how far away I am from being a comedian. And then I'm in my car and I put on the comedy channel and I go, Jesus Christ, why the fuck am I not a famous comedian? <laughs> because, uh, I, folks, I was in the car and look, I don't want to disparage anyone. All right. Everybody's got their career. They've got their niche. They've all carved it out for themselves and they're all doing very well and everybody's making money and everybody's happy, right? We're all happy. You're happy. I'm happy. He's happy. The banister's happy. Everybody's doing very well. All right. Everybody's thrilled. And if you've got your career and you're making life as a personal a professional comedian, good for you. However, if you've ever had the misfortune of stumbling into anything that Lisa Lampanelli has ever said in her fucking life, She's selling out theaters now. You do realize that. She sells out theaters with that bullshit. I heard it on my... I, and I actually made myself listen. I turned it on. It was on It was on XM. And she's talking. And she told some story. She told a joke joke. Like about two Indian women walk into a supermarket. Like that kind of thing. And she, she actually prefaced it with this. This was her fucking preface for that joke. She said, you know what? Uh, I, I like to make fun of the, you know, the blacks and the Latinos. But it's, you know what? I actually get mail. I get email from like Indian people. Indians saying, how come you don't make fun of us? How come you don't make fun of us? I will give her a million dollars if she can produce one of those fucking emails. I will give her $500,000 if she can read. <laughs> what a fucking ogre. I mean, just, you know what? I don't know who pulled her out from under a couch in Georgia and shaved her and said she could go on stage. And who taught her English from her? her 
I don't know what Millennium Falcon is transporting her across this fucking country, but stop. Run out of fuel. Fucking Boba Fett needs to show up and shoot her in the fucking head and take her and Solo back to fucking Jabba. Oh my fucking God. Awful. Atrocious. I can't think of any other word that begins with A that describes it. It's not even worth going past A in the alphabet. Awful and atrocious says it all. Why do I even have to waste B? And if you like her, great. Good for you. But when I heard it, I'm in the car going, how am I not famous? How am I not famous? She's talking about the Indian ladies, and then she gets email from Indian people, and she starts making fun of a gay guy in the front row, and you hear the theater reverberating, like people laughing their asses off. They're going crazy. And the thing is, she uses words like freaking. She says freaking, and I think she said poop or at one point or something. It's like... Why are you cleaning it up? You, you're making fun of every race in the world. Do you think it's less offensive for you to be a racist if you'd say it with like fifth grade swear words? Yep. Oh, that nigger smelled like poopy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't invalidate what you just fucking said. Oh, I can't believe that dirty freaking spick pulled out his pee pee. No, that doesn't make it all right. You're not, just because you sugarcoat it doesn't mean racism is good. And it's not really racism. I don't think she's a racist. Obviously, she's just using it to get famous, and that's fine. But, I mean, that's even worse, right? What's worse, a racist or a racist opportunist? I don't know. I can't decide. <laughs> and then she had the balls in the middle of it. She's, like, talking about the Indian people in the email, and she tells this dirty joke about the Indians. And then she goes, come on, are we having a good time here tonight? And everybody goes, woo! And I'm like, no, no, I'm not having a good time in my car. <laughs> Honestly, if I didn't realize this was on tape, I would stay in this car and drive in search of this show just to run over you on fucking stage. <laughs> Holy fuck bad. Un so bad. So atrociously bad. Actually, I got the B. <laughs> yeah, I got the B. Should have stayed today, but I had to go. I threw an A in there with atrociously, but I, I threw in B for bad. And W for Wookie. <laughs> so horrible. And she's selling out theaters. She's selling out theaters and they're seeing her. And, and you know what? Fuck that. <laughs> I'll tell you what. That's where the people who live in the storm drain came from. <laughs> there was some theater in Las Vegas, some showroom that sat 700 and all of them one night faithfully paid to come in and watch. And they saw Lisa Lampanelli tell freaking jokes and they immediately went, you know what? Fighting spiders with flamethrowers and getting addicted to heroin and living underground doesn't seem so fucking bad. This is what's going on upstairs. I'm not moving into the fucking basement right now. Grab your gear. Get me a spoon. Get me a flamethrower. Let's steal a bed and climb underground because I, if this is what's going on upstairs, I want nothing to do with it. Literally, there's the 99%, and then there's the 1%, and then there's that nebulous number that doesn't fit in either one that likes Lisa Lampanelli. I don't think I'm overselling it when I say that she actually forced those people to flee underground to escape her horrible comedy. What did I say? I said they're, they're under there because it's needles, fangs, or cock? Bullshit. Those 700 people live under there because the choice was needles, fangs, or cunt. And if you ask me, they've chosen correctly. You guys can get me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. You guys can be my friend at Facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You can follow me on Twitter at Twitter.com slash the 40-year-old boy. You can follow our friend Lily Von Stupp at Twitter.com slash Lily Von Stupp or Twitter.com slash MNTs. Uh, you can follow our friend or be our friend uh, David Hernandez uh, be his friend on Facebook <laughs> at facebook.com slash David Mex Hernandez and you can find Lily at facebook.com slash Lily Von Stupp and if you'd like to write Lily a personal note yes. and uh, you'd like to find out uh, just how tired all of her friends are <laughs> you can write her at Lily at burlesque411.com that's Lily L-I-L-I at burlesque411.com her name is Mary Gillio. Her name is Mary Gillio. Her name is Mary Gillio. His name is Aaron Malone. His name is Aaron Malone. His name is Aaron Malone.
want to remind you folks about the Monday Night Tees every Monday night at the Three Clubs on Santa Monica and Vine. Every Monday night after April 30th, that is. That was the only dark night they've had in nine years. Uh, but now with their brand new stage, from what yeah. I understand. did you, you didn't have to install that, did you? No. I never know. They always, uh, the port- <laughs> Lily, Lily does not own the three of clubs or the three clubs, but uh, she should because every time I'm talking to her, she's like, "Yeah, we went and we put in a whole new light track," and I'm like, uh, "Why? Why would you do that? You don't own the place." And then we spruced up the back room. We went and that we painted the lobby. Why are you doing these things? <laughs> well, you know, Halloween's coming up, so uh, for Halloween's Friday. We're going in Monday to get a creepiness factor, and we're going to square it away and start putting up webs. And I'm, what are you doing? Leave it alone. It's not your club. Uh, it should be, but it's not. But uh, but now you've got a new stage on which to, to play. And it looked nice. I saw it online. And is it bigger or is it just it's just newer? It's actually bigger square footage. Pretty cool. So we went from a circular stage to a square stage. Okay. So it actually filled out. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, the show this week, how'd that go? Fantastic. That was the oh Golden God. Rush Follies or something. Gold Rush Gold Follies. Rush Follies. There we go. And uh, who was the... Phil Van T was there. Phil Van T did Comedy and Magic and Pop Hayden hosted doing Comedy went and Went good. Magic. Huh? It went good. It went oh, great. Fantastic. And Big House, everybody was there. Oh, yeah. And uh, and coming up this week is is one of my favorite shows. I wanted to go. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go. Aww. I know. I'm very disappointed. Hey, you change your show from Mondays to Thursdays. Yeah, I'll get right on <laughs> you do that. Uh, can, I, can I do it at your place? Uh, what if you did the show in the building? Yeah, in the lobby there. Fuck, I'm, I'm in. in. I'm in. Uh, we don't have a new stage though. That's okay. Done. I'll build one. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah, show up on Monday, take care of it. I like it. <laughs> you come help me get some boards. No. Oh, yeah. Anything. <laughs> at Home Depot boards. What, what did that? What was that from? I forget what that. <laughs> oh, the boards. I need the lumber. Uh, what if Travolta? Well, Travolta can sing. What? I wonder if when he was lumbering with his erect penis. I'm lumbering. Please touch my anus. Uh, big hose, according to the the massage guy, which is good. Uh, so no wonder that's why he's naked and says, "Let's do it." All right, so. Uh, and we're obligated. You're obligated, folks. He's John Travolta. You owe him a handjob. The years and years of joy he's brought you through movies and television, you owe him a handjob. Um, it's the least you could do, and literally the very least you could do. Uh, <laughs> so the coming this coming week, one of my favorite shows, of course, is Madonna. Yes! Yes, and it's uh, it's a tribute to Madonna. So all of the show is uh, a tribute in their songs and all that. Are you involved? Are you dancing? Hosting the show? As Martha Quinn. Oh, that Martha Quinn. Circa 1984. We do the MNT Awards show. Oh, okay. Oh, That's fucking awesome. Uh, except for the fact that Martha Quinn is, could fit in your bra. <laughs> so I don't know how you're going to be Martha Quinn. The, and Nina Blackwood, too. There, was no, there wasn't a good... Uh, there was not one good rack at MTV. Uh, until Nina, much later. Nina Blackwood's was okay. Nah. I got a hot picture of her. And she's, she's, they're small, but they're... Small. I disagree. Yeah, no, I, she's in Vice Squad. And uh, Wings Hauser beats her up with a clothes hanger, and uh, and uh, that was a movie or it, reality? No, it was real. It was it was real. Uh, <laughs> no, it was in a movie called Vice Squad, and she played a hooker. And, and Wings Hauser is a is of course the the evil white pimp that you hear about so often. Uh, and he was an evil white pimp, and I think his name was even like Django or a Thunderbird or some bullshit. But he actually ties her to a bed, and then he heats up a coat hanger, and he uh, he burns her and beats her up with it and stuff. Yeah. Uh, fuck you. Take that, Joan Crawford. What the fuck? Yeah, you think you're somebody? Wings Hauser's got some fucking news for you. Uh, so you're hosting, so that's good news. And will you be, uh, I, well, you're Martha Quinn, so no cone bra. I can't Actually, even imagine. I do wear a cone bra. But how? How can you wear a yeah, cone bra? Come see. It's funny. Folks, it's if you want to see. I write material for this show. It's funny. I know it's funny. I saw it, I saw it two, two years ago. Was it two years ago I was there? I think it was two years ago. Um, but yeah, it's Madonna. It's a tribute to Madonna. They do the MNT Awards. She's as Martha Quinn and with a cone bra. If you want to see 44 double Ds in a cone bra, folks. <laughs> that, that, I, fuck Madonna. I mean, that, that's a... You, they thought they had magic last week with Phil Von T and, and Phil Van T and Pops Hayden. <laughs> Talk about the magic of stuffing a 44 double D rack into two cone, into a cone bra. Jesus Christ. You, you fuck the 3D Avengers. <laughs> That's in 3D. I I said double D. Fuck that. That's 44 triple D. 3D in your face. Cone bra, baby. Uh, so come and check that out. And who else is at the show? Who's working and performing? Uh, uh, the lovely and talented Lex LaCroix is performing. Uh, Isabella Starr is performing. Nikita Bitch Project is performing. No. Oh, yeah. All right. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something, folks. 
All right. I, uh, you know me, I get, uh, I, I'm not obsessed, but certain, I'll find favorites among Lily's friends of burlesque. I've never seen this Nikita Bitch project. I've never seen her perform. Lily told me that she's like, no, uh, there's this little girl who took my classes and then she performed at the tees and she's pretty hot and like amazing. Cause Lily will always clue me into the hot, the hot people. Uh, type. yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so she, uh, she goes, go on Facebook. So I went on Facebook and I looked up Nikita Bitch Project. Um, just do it. That's all. I'm, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> go look her up. Uh, there, because there, I mean, all, like, uh, there's pictures of her that are really great, and then, then there's some where you're just like, that's oh my god, like that. I mean, the, yeah, it is. It really is. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Uh, she's just hot. So uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. You, so go go find Nikita Bitch Project on Facebook, and then go to the Monday Night Tees next week on uh, May 14th. It's May Donna. Go and pay to see that, and you'll see the Nikita Bitch Project dance around and do her thing, and you'll see what you see on Facebook in person, in your face. And uh, well worth it, folks. Well worth it. I actually might come now. Actually, that changes my mind. <laughs> I might have to be there. And, uh, and hey, while we're talking about burlesque, let's tell you this, folks. There is, uh, you might remember I did the Kickstarter page last year, as I've mentioned. Um, well, when I did Kickstarter, I had to film a video for Kickstarter, and I didn't have the fucking first clue of how to do it. Lily was going to help me, and she wasn't sure what she should do. She was going to film it, and I was like, I don't know. I, I said, it has to look professional. That was the one thing that scared the hell out of me, is I didn't want to put up something looking for funding and then look like a fucking jamoke in the video. So she's like, well, I have a ton of friends who do videos. Why don't I try to contact somebody? So she contacted her friend Brian Janes. Brian C. Janes. Fuck you, pretentious C. It's Brian Janes. Um, how mean is that? The guy, it's his name. Uh, but Brian James came and filmed it with me, and he happened to bring, unbelievably, an assistant by the name of Panama Red, who was there to help him film. And then it turned out the girl who was going to help me couldn't make it, and then Panama stepped in. And the the rest, of course, as we know, is Kickstarter history. <laughs> Uh, but Brian James went out of his way to help me. He came out and, uh, and he was paid for his time. Certainly he was compensated, but at the same time he went over and above in making the video. Like he included the map, uh, and he, it was his idea to include the blooper at the end. And I, so I, these were things that were, and it, you know what? He made it professional. I would have sat in and been over his shoulder and trying to, you know, making it what I wanted to make it. But instead I trusted him. He sent it to me and I had minor changes, which he made in seconds and earned his money, you know, tenfold as far as I'm concerned. Well, uh, it turns out my friend, Brian Janes now has a Kickstarter project of his own and it's uh two, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is. He, he produced a burlesque book. And uh, our friend Lily Von Stupp is in that book, by the way, a two page spread with a great photograph of her in her burlesque outfit. And it, it really is, uh, for my money, it is it is one of, I would say it's top five photos I've ever seen of Lily. It's just it's just the look on her face. Well, you look great in it. And it's just the look on your face, though, says world weary. I mean, it, it just really works. Um, what's the book called? All that glitters, and it's about burlesque, and it has it's tons of burlesque dancers. Lily's in it, and it's interviews and photos. And uh, the Kickstarter project is to to, to raise money for uh, I, I'm. It's a book launch, a show, and a gallery exhibit. So so instead of me just telling you about the book, it'll be a gallery exhibit, a book launch, all sorts of things where people can gain attention. Uh, actually get the attention of people on focused on the book so they'll know about it rather than it just being there and people word of mouthing it this will be an actual splash so he's trying to fund it via kickstarter and uh, he's got some great rewards down there one of them is amazing it's like a photo session uh which you know would normally run double what he's charging on the rewards uh and so if you can go there if you can help him out great if you can't i totally understand because folks i'm in your fucking pocket at all times <laughs> and i'm about to be in your pocket more in the next five ten minutes here uh but brian was good to me and helped me out when he wanted to help me out and it's worth it to just look at the page and watch the video and uh, see what he's done because the book itself i mean if anything maybe you visiting the kickstarter page brings the attention to the book and then maybe you buy the book i mean who knows maybe you, you donate or you don't donate maybe you think about buying the book it's worth it i can tell you i looked at it today and i'm i, I it was funny when lily showed it to me i went what is the kickstarter for this book is done it's fucking fabulous and she goes it's to draw attention to the fabulosity of the book and i'm like oh, all right i think you just made up that word but that's fine i'll go with it uh so i wanted to throw a plug brian's way because he was nice to me and helped me out so if you can go to kickstarter look up brian james look up all that glitters i'm sure you'll be able to find it and check it out if you want to help him help him if not maybe you find the book and you buy that and then lily bring it to monday night tees and lily signs it and then she puts chocolate sauce on her boobs and presses them into the the back of the book perfect yeah she'll do that uh so look forward to that and also don't forget may donna at the monday night tees uh if you guys go to facebook.com slash the 40 year old boy you will go there and be my friend and uh what are you doing Lily is, you know what that looked like, right? I mean, 
uh, Lily's she's she like sprinkled something on her jeans. It, it, it just falling out. Whatever. I can't even tell you what it looked like. You know what it looked like. Uh, shut up. I whatever. Uh, awful. So hand gel. Wait a minute. Hold on, folks. Is Travolta here? I I didn't even see him show up because Lily is covering herself with hand gel and then dripping it all over her jeans. Oh, what are you doing to me? I didn't even see Travolta walk in, and, I re- and you're getting prepped. Is he here? I can't hear him. Did you hear him in the hallway? So like, wait, hey, my hair. And then like, uh, or maybe, maybe did you hear Staying Alive? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he has Staying Alive start every day. And once you hear Staying Alive, folks, oil up your fucking hands. The second you hear Staying Alive, oil up your hands because you owe a blowjob. No, hand job. Don't oil up your hands. You're going to have a blowjob. That's awful. You get oil in your mouth. There's, there's oil that works, though, for that. Never mind. Who cares? Uh, yeah, okay. You keep that. Sure. Why not? Uh, the fuck was I talking about? <laughs> Neil Hamburger. So, <laughs> flip it through, Mrs. Brody. Hotchkiss. Brody. If you go to facebook.com slash the 40-year-old boy, you can be my friend there, as I've mentioned. Uh, and you can find Lily and David through their pages, as I've mentioned. If you want to sign up, there are plenty of pages to bring me to your town, folks, to do this stuff that I talked about during the show, my one-man person show. Uh, one-man person? Why did I call it that? I don't know. Uh, so come on out to that show. If uh, There's plenty of pages for you can show your support. Fresno still exists. San Antonio, Buffalo. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, uh, I've am i got to be a little more discerning about the, the shows that I choose because the Kickstarter uh, funding covered, you know, some cities, but now I'm, I'm actually out of pocket again for my shows. So uh, so I with ticket prices, whatever the fuck, I, I need to kind of watch it a little bit. So um, if you want me to come to your town, support those pages. There's uh, Fresno, there's Buffalo, there's London. London is really popular. It's just, man, is it expensive to go there? It's crazy expensive. I have to go my, uh, I get my passport this week. That'll be exciting for the Toronto show, which is coming up June 29th. June 29th, I'm in Toronto at Comedy Bar. Uh, tickets are moving, but I'd like them to move more because, again, I really want to prove to that dude that people want to see me up there, and I didn't make a mistake because he was horrified by it. He was as weirded out as Brody was. <laughs> Actually, he was more weirded out. Well, that just sounds terrible. Um, so I'm June 29th. I'm in Toronto at Comedy Bar. And remember, June 15th, I'm in Kansas City at the Westport uh, Coffee House Theater in the basement. And I may be taping there. I'm not sure. It all depends on tickets sold and all that sort of stuff. Uh, And also, June 1st, please remember, I'm in Boston at the Cambridge YMCA Theater. That's Friday, June 1st. Tickets for all of these, by the way, are available at brownpapertickets.com. Search my name or search the cities I've mentioned. June 1st in Boston at the Cambridge YMCA Theater. June 15th in Kansas City at the Westport Coffee House Theater. And June 29th at Comedy Bar in Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada. And also July 27th at Indianapolis, Indiana. Now, let's talk Indianapolis for a second. Uh, I booked it and uh, screwed up. Because someone wrote me and they're like, dude, it's going to be awesome that you're here. It's Brickyard 400 weekend. Um, I didn't know that. I didn't book it to come see you guys drive in a circle. I didn't. I came to do my show and then take off. Uh, but unfortunately, when you have a big race in town, I think it's going to fuck me hotel wise. Uh, so I already started looking for hotels and I, I went to Priceline and I was, I was having no luck. No luck whatsoever. <laughs> Um, so if you guys have any suggestions, I'm up, up for that or open for that. I don't know. The show's July 27th. It's a Friday night, July 27th. And I'll leave, you know, the 28th. I'm probably only, I'm probably just coming to town because again, with Kickstarter, I came to town a little early cause I was meeting people and doing things. I think with these other cities, I, I don't think I can come in for an extra day. Uh, I, I love coming in Wednesday and having Wednesday and Thursday in town, but it, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, as much as I want to do it, uh, I might do it in Kansas City. I don't think I can do it in Indianapolis, whatever the fuck. I'm still trying to figure it out, kind of feeling my way. Um, but yeah, so I, Indianapolis right now, I can't believe I booked it during the Brickyard, whatever the fuck. Uh, so if you have any ideas for me, tell me. I don't know what, what ideas I'm looking for, quite frankly. Do you have any storm drains? I guess that's what it is. Do you have any... <laughs> Are there any storm drains in Indianapolis? Because, I mean, I, I again, I have, uh, I've armed with the knowledge of how to survive at least for a day. So if I can just come to town and sleep in the storm drain, I'll be fine, I guess. Uh, and you don't have any spiders there. No Black Widow spiders, certainly. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. So that's July 27th at the Indie Fringe Theater in Indianapolis. Uh, and I will say those tickets not moving. Uh, so if you, if you want, and again, it's months away, but it would be nice to see some momentum because you guys were the first city, I think, on Kickstarter, actually. Uh, so why not uh, prove it? Why not? I, it took me two years to find a venue, so buy some tickets. That would be great. Uh, Indianapolis, uh, Boston, Kansas City, Toronto, all booked. 
Detroit still looking for a venue, trying to make that happen. And uh, a couple other cities I've also made some phone calls on. And uh, speaking of phone calls, yes, Gio, I will call you, I swear. <laughs> I finally called Ryan. I finally called my web guy to get him squared away. And uh, and he's he's been great, you know. So we're we're implementing the changes. That's all coming up, and we've got some other stuff. Uh, you know, there's if you go to mikeschmidtcomedy dot com and you go to the Joe Business page, you know, there's the link to there for tweakedaudio.com dot com slash forty. Uh, if you go to tweakedaudio.com slash forty, you can go ahead and buy auto erotic asphyxiation earbuds and also cockering watches. Those are available. Tweaked has been very good to me, so be very good to them and help them out if you would, because they help me out when you help them out. <laughs> Uh, so go to tweetaudio.com slash 40, and then there's the link there for Zazzle with uh, mugs and mouse pads. For the time being, if you want a mouse pad, get it now because they're coming down. I'm tired of saying mugs and mouse pads, and I think we're going to something different. I know we are because I've seen the designs, but it's coming up. So uh, in, the, in the next, so if you want a mouse pad, fucking, because, I mean, you haven't bought it in two years. Why not rush now when it's coming down? I'm sure you've been waiting, just like the people in Indianapolis. You're waiting for the last second, but I'm telling you that last second has arrived. It is now doomsday for the mouse pads, folks, so if you want them, grab uh, and then there's a link there for download sets. There's the uh, year one, year two, and year three. That's uh, there's well, there's uh, you know the return of the Schmidt, uh, the fellowship of the Schmidt, and of course the two Schmitties, and also the Lord of the Schmidt set, which is all of them combined. You can get all three for the price of sixty dollars, and that's also changing in the coming weeks. Um, they'll be coming down, and the, the Lord set will be disappearing, and some new thing will be in its place. I've already seen the designs for that, and that's what Ryan is very hard at work doing. So even before I get the rest of the website done, I think we'll have the other stuff ready. Uh, but So just be patient. If you want a Lord set, though, buy it, because it's going to be coming down very soon. Uh, and also, you can donate to the show in the upper left-hand corner of every page on MikeSchmidtComedy.com. There's a little Schmitty. Got his pocket out. Click on him and make a one-time donation, or make a $2 a month, $5 a month, or $10 a month donation. And uh, then perhaps your, your name will be mentioned on the show, which it will in the coming weeks, I swear, once I sit down and I get all my paperwork squared away. Because <laughs> I, I used to have a list, and then I don't have a list anymore, and then I started to do the Kickstarter stuff, and those names are being mentioned. It's, uh, it's a festival of names, folks. I'm mentioning everybody. Everyone's getting mentioned. Even Bed and Breakfast Guy gets mentioned on this show, for fuck's sake. Uh, he's going to be so mad at me. Now he's going to write me a note. Do you ever notice that when you call me Bed and Breakfast Guy, you say it in a mean way, but if you came to my Bed and Breakfast, you'd love the bed and the breakfast? Yes, I probably would. Um, what if he, what if he's in a storm drain? What if he has a bed and breakfast in a storm? Wait, wait, look in the storm, fuck bed and breakfast in the storm drain. They have a bed and I'm sure they find breakfast eventually, but I guarantee his bed and breakfast is spider free. <laughs> so donate to the show. That would help. Uh, and I'll say your name eventually. I promise. I swear. Uh, and, uh, I'll tell you this folks. I am uh, sitting here, uh, ready to go. I worked out yesterday. Uh, I, I worked out after I talked to you, I visited Richard and hung out and worked out. And then uh, my back seized up and I couldn't work out Friday. I was supposed to go visit Richard, the trainer, and uh, I couldn't move. It was weird. I went to uh, the pilot on Thursday night and I kept shifting in my seat because I couldn't, I couldn't get comfortable because my back was fucked up, my lower back. And, uh, but I was like, oh, well, I'll be okay. And then Friday I woke up and I was supposed to go train and I, I could not stand up straight. I was like at a weird angle and in my head, you know, there's always, I don't want to be a pussy. I think I've told you this a million times. So in my head, there's pain, there's pain you fight through and then there's pain you try to fix. So I didn't know which one this was. So I texted Richard and I'm like, Hey, my back is seized up and I've been like trying to stretch in the shower, but I can't, I can barely stand up and just, I have a hot shower pounding down on it. And he goes, well, make sure you ice your back. And I said, well, I've been using heat and stretching. Like, is that the right thing? And he's like, no, you need to ice your back. And eventually you'll wind up heating it. But, but first you ice it. And uh, I said, well, ah, fuck all that. That just means I got to go get ice and stupid shit. So I continue to do the heating and the stretching, which worked out fine. Because I knew it was just pain that I had to work through for a couple days. Um, but, uh, but it made, you know, I couldn't. I, so I missed working out with him. And then I went to Avengers. I saw the Avengers on Saturday morning. And I, I same thing. I kept shifting in my seat. And uh, it was awful. It's just, you know, and it's just stuff you work through because your, your muscles announce themselves. Like they're, they're reintroducing themselves to you because now you're waking them up and they're pissed. They've been hibernating for fucking three years. So then when you wake them up out of a dead sleep, they're like, fuck you, dick. And they're trying to do everything they can to make you sit back down in your easy chair. Um, so I worked out yesterday and uh, my back was fine. But uh, hey, guess who showed up and was very angry about being woken up? My abs. Hey, folks, I have abs. <laughs> 
I forgot that I had abs. And uh, last week when I was working out with Richard, I did core work. So I did planking, a ton of planking. And then I did the thing where you lay on your back and you do a sit up, but over your head, you're holding a bozu ball and you meet it with your feet. So you do a leg lift and a sit up at the same time, like an inverted, like a V, you know what I mean? So I did that last week and I was real happy because I was able to pull it off and I was fine. Uh, and then I went to work out with him yesterday and he's like, all right, man, let's, let's do some, uh, let's bang out some pushups real quick. And I got down in pushup position. And when I did my, I screamed like, I, not screamed like a lady, but, uh, I'm not, I screamed like Jamie Cur- Lee Curtis in Halloween. No, I, uh, <laughs> I yelled like, I was like, ah, like that, that kind of thing. Because, um, and I fell because I could not support my own weight with my abs just from even doing pushups. Like, you know, my hands and my feet were fine, but my center was, my core was having nothing to do with it. And I fell down and I looked at him and I go, I was like, dude, I go, that was scary. He's like, what? And I told him what happened. And he's like, oh, that's not good. And, uh, he goes, <laughs> You'll be fine though. He goes, you'll be fine. Just, you know, get, get, let's do these push-ups. Let's bang them out. And so I could not get into push-up position. And he's like, well, you know what? Just get on your knees, your hands and knees and we'll do them. And, uh, and it still hurt, but not nearly as much. And I was like, fuck dude. I go, this hurts. And he goes, I go, is this, is this the pain you fight through? Or is this the pain you fix? He goes, this is the pain you fight through. I said, let's do it. So I did. I fucking, you know, busted out like 25 push-ups and then got up and did lunges and jumps and twists and every other fucking thing and then ran a mile and a half afterwards and uh, felt awesome afterwards. You feel awesome. You know what? It's that hour before you go work out because I have to get up at three and eat a bowl of oatmeal. I'll have a fucking bowl of oatmeal with like almonds and raisins and blueberries and flaxseed in it. I throw it all in there and uh, and then I got to go at four and I'm dreading it. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, I could probably say I can't go. I could text it. I could say the car. I, you, you just keep making every excuse. But then when you get there and you just start fucking doing it, then you're doing it. And then afterwards, when you're on the fucking treadmill and you're running, because I did the high knees yesterday, I got, I, I got fucking adrenaline and uh, it was great. It was so great. So I was very excited. Um, but I will tell you, it's weird working out, and here's why. I uh, <laughs> uh, I got waxed. I went back uh, to get waxed again like two weeks. I did it before Cleveland. Um, I did it like the Monday before I went to Cleveland uh, because you never know. You know, if, if Travolta shows up and goes, hey, let's go out for hand jobs, I want to be clean and, and, and re- looking good. So, uh, so I was, I was, uh, I got waxed the Monday before I went to, and I saw Renee, and this is actually pretty funny. Um, well, the, 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 <laughs> all right, I'll tell you this first. I went to get waxed with Renee, and uh, he's like, oh, it's nice to see you again. And he remembered me after I got there. He didn't remember me on the phone. And uh, and he's waxing me, and he's you know he got his face in my balls, and he's going to work. And uh, and I said to him, I go, you know, I, uh, I talked about you on my show. And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, I actually, I actually did an impression of you, and I talked about you, and I told people about the because I thought that was the whole point was there was a vote, and they voted for me to see a guy. Remember, and I told you all that. And he goes, oh yes, I remember that. He goes, I want to hear that show. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I have to hear that show. Were you mean to me? Did you say a mean thing? And I go, no. I, I go, you're the hero of the fucking show because you were. You're funny. And he's like, I have to hear it. And I go, well, I go. The thing is, it's down. It's usually on iTunes. And I go, it was a while ago. And he's like, oh, I, re- I, but I really want to hear it. And I said, um, I don't know what that accent is, by the way. I guess it's sort of Renee. Uh, and I said, uh, well, I mean, I guess I could email you the episode. And he's like, oh, you have to. You have to. I will give you my email. <laughs> I said, but then he got it downloaded. It's like big. It's like t- it's almost like three hours. Because I, t- I also told him, I go, you know, when I left you last time, I went down to Revolver to use the bathroom. And a guy chased me into the bathroom and like basically <laughs> pinned me. And he goes, he goes, that's hilarious. He goes, did you not tell him you were straight? And I go, it doesn't matter. They don't care. You're in the bathroom in a gay bar. They just fucking follow you down there. That's what they do. It's like Travolta. The guy was lumbering around with his erect penis going side to side. What the fuck do I say? He wasn't famous enough to jerk off, so I hid in the fucking stall. And Renee's like, that's hilarious. I can't believe that happened to you. You should have come back upstairs. I go, I was already trapped in the bathroom. He's like, you have to send me that episode. So I, I got his email. After I left, I paid. I got his email address. So I have to send him. I haven't sent it to him yet. I'm going to send it to him today because uh, I forgot I went out of town. But yeah, I'm going to send him the fucking episode and see what he says. Uh, but the, the point is I got waxed. And, uh, and so now I have to wear, like underneath, when I work out, you know, I wear my knee pads, but then I wear um, Under Armour bicycle pants, uh, which is fine because I need them on. I wear, I wear, here's the layers. Folks, you were very concerned about what I wear to my workout. I understand that. So I have a shoe and a sock, and then I have the knee pads, these monster bionic fucking awesome knee pads. And then I have uh, these bike pants and then shorts over those. And then I have an Under Armour, like a long sleeve wiki top, and then a, a shitty shirt over that. So uh, that's what I work out in. But the thing is, here's the, and normally it, it's a perfect workout outfit. It's a Superman workout outfit. I can do whatever the fuck you need me to do in that outfit. However, because I become waxed. I don't know if I become waxed. I was waxed. <laughs> Folks, I become wax. 
It's like you become Wrath, Agent Kulyan. Open the box and become wax. Oh, what's in the box? Why doesn't it have hair? Um, so I become wax, and uh, I so I throw on these bike pants, and uh, they're slidey. They're slidey anyway. That's one of the cool things about them is it's like you know they you know your fucking cock looks great, and then you, your hand slides all over them. It's like you're hey, who's this new guy? Hey, Mister Travolta, I like your new pants. Uh, so I put them on and I go to work out and it's fine. I wear them and I get to the gym, but then I start doing things working out wise. And, uh, I realize that they're not adhering to my body the way bicycle pants should, because, uh, everything underneath them is gone. I mean, I've had everything removed, uh, except for, of course, my cock. And that's not, that's no help during a workout. He's pissed off I'm there, uh, but there's no traction for these pants to grab onto. So he has me doing stuff like running and doing lateral shifts and then jumping up and down. And when, uh, the jumps are the worst because then I do jumps, 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 and then my shorts are like sliding because my shorts used to slide off the bike pants, but I didn't care because I was getting into shape and I was like, oh, well, I show a little ass. Who cares? Everybody likes it. But now the bike pants themselves are sliding off. So it looks like a fat guy is just shedding his dolphin skin right there in the middle of the fucking gym. It's terrible. I'm jumping up and down and it's sliding off. And uh, and it was what was cool was Richard was like he thought it was great. He's like, oh, Big Mike, look at that. He goes, you're, you're already losing weight, my Big Mike. Your clothes are falling off. And I go, nah, dude. It's like I purposely wear these giant clothes, and and there's just and he goes, well, no, man, it looks like those clothes don't fit you anymore. You must be losing weight. I go, no, really, trust me, you don't want to know. You don't want to know because there's no traction. That's the thing is there's no traction for my fucking slidey pants to hang onto, so they're slipping off. And then and then also if they slide off, then everybody in the gym is like fat waxed guy. Oh my god, it's like that's got to be a tragedy on the level of call the cops right doesn't don't you think uh i'm worried about guys with open wounds in the hot tub but then i, I immediately flashed waxed bag at everybody and like the whole situation changes so uh, so i'm like look you don't trust me you don't want to know and he goes well what is it why don't they fit and i go trust me you don't want to know because that's not a conversation I, I fuck i'm embarrassed having that conversation with you people i certainly don't want to have it with richard my hero the love of my life i don't want to drop that in his lap hey well the thing was monday i got waxed and now these are sliding off and eventually you're gonna see that i don't have a, a, a what there's no what what Because I have a tone. Because you know why? Because I talk quickly and I don't I don't fucking think. That's why. I think that's what it means when you have a tone. Is you don't fucking bother to care what comes flying out of your goddamn mouth. I try to grow the show and I want people to get on board and they're like, eh, I listen to it and you talk too fast. Really, I talk too fast. How the hell else am I supposed to cram all of this into a small three-hour window? Dude, this is there's no script. I just go over this shit on the fly. It makes me laugh. If it doesn't make you laugh, turn the fucking station. And by turn the station, I mean turn the wheel of your car right into a guardrail. Jesus, fuck. Where are you where are you going? Boy, boy, boy.